A pair of SCP Foundation researchers open the door of a containment cell and find themselves staring at something unlike anything they've ever seen before. Sitting in the middle of the room is a giant lump that appears to be made of what can only be described as flesh. The two look at each other in disbelief. Just what is this thing? They circle the huge blob, looking it over, wondering what on earth it could be. One of the researchers finally gets the courage to actually feel it. He finds that it's warm to the touch. And does he detect some slight movement? He slowly moves to place his ear against it to listen, but a sudden shudder from the mask sends him jumping back in fright. Just then, the other researcher calls to him from the other side of the sphere. It sounds like he has found something. As he approaches, he too sees what caused his partner to call out. There, in the middle of this tumorous ball, is a door. It's a circular iron hatch, the kind sealed by a valve, and it's open. Now the researchers are really confused. A massive lump of living flesh is strange enough, but why does it have a door? One of the researchers peeks inside. Is that a couch they see? And a table? Does someone live in this thing? Things are getting beyond strange. The two researchers look up at the observation window where their supervisor is watching them. The supervisor does not hesitate. He nods at them, and the researchers know what they must do. Rock, paper, scissors, shoot. The researcher who lost winces. He knew that coming to work at the SCP Foundation meant that he would be dealing with some strange, dangerous, and disgusting anomalies. But he never imagined he would have to climb inside a giant orb of meat. His partner opens the hatch all the way and offers a hand to help him. Knowing he has no other option, the researcher steps inside. Inside, the air is hot, thick, and moist, like a cramped gym that's had too many bodies exerting themselves on a warm, humid day. He walks through the short entranceway, and his eyes adjust to the dim light to find that he's standing in the middle of a cozy little room. A single, small lamp on a table is giving off just enough light for him to see that the room is sparsely furnished, with a few pieces including a small couch and a twin bed. Outside, his partner calls to him, asking what he can see. As the researcher turns to answer, the door snaps shut. The valve spins on its own, locking itself tight. Try as he might, the researcher can't get it to budge. He bangs on the door and yells, Is he alright in there? Is everything okay? His only response is a muffled scream from inside the ball of flesh. He keeps pulling at the door, twisting the valve with all of his strength, but it won't move. The sounds of gurgles and wet sloshing come from inside the meaty growth. An alarm starts to sound as he strains against the door, exerting himself so hard that he feels like a vein in his head might burst. Suddenly, the valve loosens, and the sudden lack of resistance causes him to fall to the floor. The valve spins on its own, and the door swings open once again. The ball of flesh is quiet once more. The researcher picks himself up off the ground and slowly, carefully, peeks inside. Hello? Are you okay? Is anyone in there? There's no response. That is until a blast of hot air comes rushing out of the hatch, blowing the researcher's hair back. When it's over, he peeks inside again. His fellow researcher is nowhere to be seen. Inside is the same couch, bed, and table with a small lamp. But there's something new there, too. Across from the couch, where there was nothing before, is a small television. While this may seem strange, it's just another day at the SCP Foundation, where anomalous objects and creatures are studied and contained, including SCP-002, also known as The Living Room. SCP-002 is the designation given to a large, tumorous, fleshy growth. It's roughly spherical, with a circumference just over 15 meters, giving it an estimated volume of around 60 meters cubed. Located on one side is an iron valve hatch, similar to what might be found on an old submarine, which leads into the interior of the ball. Those who step inside are surprised to discover a small room that resembles a low-rent studio apartment, complete with furniture and even a small window. Strangely, the outside of the ball of flesh shows no windows, and indeed no openings at all, save for the iron hatch. The furniture in the room displays no anomalous properties, 
though examination has revealed that the furniture appears to be constructed of sculpted bone, woven hair, and other biological substances, all coming from human bodies. Analysis of samples taken from the furniture has shown each to be constructed from independent and fragmented DNA sequences, several of which correspond to SCP research personnel who have been lost inside of SCP-002. To date, the living room has been responsible for seven members of staff going missing. At the same time, during the course of its containment at the SCP Foundation, the room appears to have added multiple additional furnishings, including two lamps, a throw rug, a television, a radio, a beanbag chair, three books in an unknown language, four children's toys, and a small potted plant. Tests have been performed using a variety of non-human entities in order to see if they would provoke a similar response from SCP-002 to that of humans. Various lab animals, including those with close DNA to humans such as chimpanzees, have been placed in the room. But so far, all have failed to make the living room react. Human cadavers were also tested, but they too did not produce any effect. It is unknown what causes SCP-002 to engage in its behavior, but whatever process it uses to convert organic matter into furnishings seems to only be triggered by the presence of living human beings. SCP-002 was discovered in northern Portugal following reports of an object falling from Earth's orbit. There in the bottom of a small crater was SCP-002. It was encased in a thick shell of rock, but the anomaly's fleshy exterior could be seen through cracks that were likely created by the impact. A local farmer was the first to spot the object falling to Earth and brought word of what he found to his village. At the same time, a Level 4 SCP Foundation agent stationed in the area detected elevated levels of radioactivity and traced the source back to the crater. An SCP collection squad led by General Mulhausen was dispatched to the impact site and quickly secured the area. Test subjects from the nearby village were recruited for initial analysis of the object, with three men being individually sent inside of SCP-002, all of whom disappeared. Having confirmed this anomaly's deadly properties, General Mulhausen then issued a Level 4A termination order that would apply to any local witnesses in order to ensure that no knowledge of the object reached the outside world. He then oversaw its transport to an SCP containment facility. As Foundation staff prepped SCP-002 for relocation, four members of the security personnel were seemingly mesmerized and drawn inside the object where they too disappeared. This was the first hint that SCP-002 possesses some form of subtle mind control with the ability to influence humans into stepping inside of it. It was after these losses that it was first noticed that the object appeared to grow new furnishings following someone disappearing inside. After these mishaps, General Mulhausen ordered all staff to wear hazmat suits when dealing with SCP-002, and following the General's own termination, SCP-002 was placed in containment at the secure facility where it currently resides. Due to the ongoing danger presented by SCP-002, the risk it poses to any who step inside of it, and the mind control abilities it possesses, it has been classified as Euclid. It is to remain connected at all times to a suitable power supply to keep it in a charging mode of some kind, which appears to make it more docile. In the event of a power outage, staff in the immediate area are to be evacuated and the object's containment cell emergency barrier is to be closed, sealing it off from the rest of the site. Once power is re-established, strobing X-ray and ultraviolet lights are to be activated in the containment cell until SCP-002 is returned to its charging mode. Research teams investigating SCP-002 that will come within 20 meters of the object must consist of no fewer than two members. Personnel should also maintain physical contact with one another at all times to confirm that the other is present and not experiencing any feelings of confusion, dulled perception, or other forms of bewilderment that may lead to them entering the living room. No personnel at all below a level 3 clearance are allowed inside of SCP-002, and any staff that have contact with the anomaly are to be escorted no less than 5 kilometers away and must undergo a 72-hour quarantine and psychological evaluation. SCP-002 is one of the oldest anomalies in the SCP Foundation database, but remains one of the least understood. Perhaps one day we'll understand what it is and why it was at one time sitting in the orbit of Earth. Did someone send it here, intending us to one day find it? Did it come here of its own volition? Or did we put it there ourselves, in an attempt to keep it away? 
A knife in the dark, bloody teeth, and an appetite about to bring an end to one of history's most infamous monsters. The year is 1888, and the streets of London are teeming with tension and fear. In the daytime, people struggle to find work, fighting each other tooth and nail for scraps of opportunity. The sunlight only serves to illuminate the grime and misery, the workhouses and the factories, the smokestacks pumping poison into the sky. At night, though, it's even worse. The gas lamps provide only ghostly wisps of dim light, just enough to see a stranger's shadow from the corner of your eye, but not enough to see if the glint of something shiny in his hand is his pocket watch or his knife. You might glance over your shoulder for a closer look, but he's already disappeared into the fog if he was ever even there at all. These streets feel haunted even on the quietest of nights, but lately there are rumors swirling in the air of something far worse than a ghost skulking through the alleys. More real than the devil, more evil than any ordinary man, there's a killer on the prowl, and his name is Jack the Ripper. At first, most citizens refused to take notice of his presence, writing off his victims as women of ill repute, bound to meet a dreadful demise sooner or later. But as the bodies piled up, the sheer brutality of the killings became impossible to ignore. Now, everyone is on edge, particularly if their daily business takes them to London's east side, where the murders began. Once hoped to be a place of opportunity for those traveling to London from afar to seek their fortunes, Whitechapel has become a den of sin and terror. No one can breathe easy here, not until the Ripper is caught, if he ever is. There are theories, of course, accused noblemen, surgeons, butchers, and doctors. Whoever the culprit is, one thing is certain. He knows his way around a knife. Still, no one suspect seems to stick, and no one theory is compelling enough to lead to an arrest. Privately, behind locked doors where no policeman can hear them whispering, the people of Whitechapel are beginning to wonder whether the Ripper will ever be found. Perhaps this nightmare won't cease until the streets run red with blood. But even in the middle of hell on earth, day-to-day -day matters must still be attended to. So even as he worries for the lives of his customers and his own livelihood, the owner of a local pub posts a job listing, seeking a new cook. He doesn't need anything fancy, he can't pay for much, just a fellow who knows his way around a kitchen and can cook up decent enough food without accidentally slicing his fingers off. Still, he's not sure there's anyone out there who would be too happy to take a job so close to Jack the Ripper's domain at the moment. But the next day, as he comes in to unlock the doors and set up for the day, he finds an applicant waiting for him outside, grinning ear to ear. He's a massive fellow towering over the pub owner at a height he's never seen before outside of a circus performer on stilts. But he greets the pub owner with a firm handshake and follows him inside, though he has to hunch a great deal to fit through the door. It's not as if there's a line of applicants out the door, so the pub owner goes ahead and hires him as the new cook. The cook is a Frenchman, but he won't hold it against him. That night, when the pub opens for business, the new cook gets right to work. From his disposition, one would never know he's working for pennies in a dingy pub in the most dangerous part of town. He bustles around the modest kitchen, chopping meat and singing in a warm, loud voice that carries through the whole building, bringing some much-needed cheer to the exhausted customers. Pretty soon, they get a taste of the new cook's work, mutton and potatoes and juicy meat pies. Whoever this new worker is, the crowd is pleased to have him around. The owner does advise the cook to stay in the kitchen, though. His food and his singing may be popular but his appearance might frighten the already skittish regulars. There's plenty to be afraid of these days, no need to add a giant to the mix. When the pub closes up for the night, the owner stops for a moment to chat with his new cook. He can't help but be curious about the man, where he came from, what brought him to London. The cook tells him, tearfully, that he was once a soldier in the French army, but that he lost his military career following a tragic accident he refused to disclose the details of. After that, he worked in a circus, then as a private chef in the home of a wealthy French family, until he was thrown out over a forbidden love affair with his boss's daughter. The pub owner isn't sure he believes a word of it, but he nods along just the same. He asks the cook when he first arrived in London, the 1st of April, he says, and with that, he heads off home, leaving the pub owner alone with his thoughts, the color draining from his face. April 1st was only two days before the first Jack the Ripper victim was discovered. It couldn't be could it? As the pub owner embarked on his journey home, he replayed the image of the cook's work that night over and over in his mind. 
The man was plenty competent with a knife, that was certain. He was strong enough to kill quickly, too. With those hands, he could squeeze the life out of someone before they even got the chance to scream. He could have done it. But why would he? He seemed like such a friendly man, odd though he was. And he was odd, almost frightening. He had clearly lied about his past as well. What reason would he have for doing that, if not to conceal a dark and terrible secret? The pub owner lies awake all night, horrific visions of his new cook keeping him from sleep. The next day, the pub owner's suspicions begin to fester and grow. He notices things he didn't pick up on before, the strange way the cook always speaks through his teeth, the deft way that he handles a butcher knife, slicing through the cuts of meat that he brings to the pub himself. What butcher is he going to? Where is he finding so much meat in such scarce times? The owner shudders at the possibilities. His customers are starting to take notice of his change in attitude, too. They see the sweat dotting his brow, his furtive glances toward the kitchen, and the way his hands shake when he brings them their plates of food. Several customers corner the owner and demand an explanation. These days, they can't let any unusual behavior go on for long. Something sinister could be afoot, after all. The pub owner relents and confesses his suspicions that his newly hired cook might be the Ripper himself. Not only that, but he's afraid the meat he's been preparing might not be sourced from any livestock, but from more of the Ripper's victims. It was an unwise choice to admit these fears to a group of men driven to the edge of reason by their own dread, bodies in the streets, and a bit too much ale. They swarm the kitchen to confront the cook and are shocked at the sight of the behemoth they find there. The cook greets them with his usual smile, but they aren't having any of it. They attack him in spite of his intimidating size, pummeling him with their fists. The cook tries to reason with the men, but they are determined to get an answer out of him, and his previously unfailing smile falters. He opens his mouth wide and in a truly shocking display, gobbles up one of the men in two quick bites. He spits out a shoe and it flies across the room, hitting another one of the men in the face. There is silence for a long moment, and then sheer pandemonium. The surviving men tear out of the pub, spilling into the streets in a drunken, panic-stricken mob. Wiping his mouth, the cook turns to see his boss, staring at him with wide eyes, frozen to the spot in fear. With a polite bow, the cook gives his resignation, apologizes for the disruption, and turns to see himself out. Meanwhile, the pub patrons are cornering a policeman, demanding he follows them to the location of a giant, man-eating monster who they believe to be the Ripper. The policeman laughs in their faces and advises them to head home and sleep off their drinks before they get themselves into any more trouble. With a full belly, but without a job, and without anywhere else to go, the cook ducks out the door to the pub and begins to stroll slowly down the dark, dingy streets. Up ahead, he sees a woman walking alone. She drops something on the ground, a small coin purse. She doesn't notice it fall, and keeps walking. But the cook is very much a gentleman, in spite of his cannibalistic indiscretion before. He hurries over and bends to pick it up. When he looks back at the woman, he sees a man creeping up behind her. The shadowy man draws a knife and lifts his arm, preparing to strike. The cook cries out to warn the woman, and she turns, letting out a blood-curdling scream at the sight of both the would-be killer and the giant with blood still dripping from his chin. She picks up her skirts and runs as fast as she can, disappearing down a nearby alley and out of sight. The cook still holds her coin purse in his massive hand, but there's no way she'll come back to retrieve it now. The man with the knife turns on the cook with a roar of primal rage. He slashes at the giant with his knife but it merely glances off of the enormous man's tough skin, not drawing so much as a single drop of blood. He tries again and again, but fails to make even a mark. Frustrated, exhausted, and still a little bit hungry, the giant grabs hold of the attempted killer, lifts him into the air, opens his mouth wide, and swallows him whole in a single gulp. The knife, still stained with the blood of his previous victims, clatters to the ground. The cook sighs and tucks the coin purse into his pocket, then he continues on his way, walking out of London and on to the next chapter of his life's grand adventure. He has no idea that his climactic meal in Whitechapel was none other than the infamous Jack the Ripper, and the people of London will never know of the unintentional act of heroism he committed that day. They will only remember the fear and the sight of a giant devouring a man alive. But soon enough, that will fade from memory, replaced with relief when no new victims are found and then replaced again with a mystery that will endure for hundreds of years. Though that cook was no ripper, he was also clearly no ordinary man. Before they decided to drive him out of town, 
the people of Whitechapel had, unbeknownst to them, been eating and drinking with SCP-082. SCP-082 is, according to his genetic makeup, a perfectly ordinary human. However, one look at SCP-082 makes it clear that he is far from ordinary. Some sort of external process has caused him to grow to an enormous size, standing at 8 feet tall and weighing around 700 pounds. Foundation researchers are divided in opinion over the exact cause of SCP-082's unique proportions. Some theorize that it is some sort of mutation, others propose an extreme hormone imbalance, some believe it to be chemical in nature, while others insist that only a supernatural force could be responsible for such a dramatic deviation from the norm. Whatever the case may be, SCP-082 is a formidable and visually impressive specimen. His head is bald and slightly pointed, his chin and jaw are large and round, his nose is bulbous, and his eyes are dark and sunken. His body has a high fat content but also contains notable muscle mass, and his physical strength should not be discounted. His forearms have a circumference of around 28 inches, and his fists are nearly an entire foot across the knuckles. Suffice it to say, he is not the sort of opponent you would want to come up against in a fight, and certainly not someone to antagonize, though medical examinations of his body indicate that at least a few likely ill-fated individuals have tried over the years. His skin is covered with scars, and though his x-rays are difficult to read due to the density of muscle tissue, scans have indicated that there are dozens of bullets and several blades, from knives and swords alike, buried in the man's flesh. Clearly, SCP-082 has been through a great deal of hardship. But you wouldn't know it from his disposition. He is gregarious and polite, with a personality as big as the rest of him. Oh, that reminds me, I've been extremely rude. He has a name. It's Fernand. At least, that's what he says. Fernand speaks fluent French, but is proficient in English as well, though he speaks with a heavy accent. Whenever he does speak, he does so with a smile, talking through his tightly clenched and massive teeth. Occasionally, he clenches these teeth so hard that his gums will begin bleeding from the effort. The reason for this is unknown, but the SCP Foundation considers it normal behavior for Fernand, whatever that means. I have my own personal theory regarding Fernand's penchant for clenching his teeth, but I won't get into that just yet. Fernand does occasionally open his mouth all the way and separate his teeth, but only when he is eating or singing. He is quite the musical talent, serenading the SCP Foundation with his takes on well-known classical music, as well as long-forgotten drinking songs and the occasional sea shanty. He loves to sing while cooking, which he is permitted to do under strict Foundation supervision. He is allowed access to a rudimentary set of cooking implements whenever he prepares his food, including a butcher knife that he also uses to shave his unusually thick facial hair. He is given various ingredients to prepare on request, with the stipulation that these ingredients must not be too expensive or human in origin. In spite of his off-putting appearance and tendency to speak through his teeth, Fernand is easily one of the more likable anomalies contained by the Foundation. He doesn't express overt hostility like SCP-682, nor does he attempt to diagnose staff with any sort of pestilence like SCP-049. All he seemingly wants to do is cook, sing, and play dress-up. Did I mention his costume trunk yet? Well, he has one. Some of his favorite outfits include a tuxedo, complete with top hat and a monocle, a military uniform serves of the French Revolution, a ball gown that comes with an elegant fan and matching beaded purse, and a clown costume that includes a wig and a trick water-squirting flower in its pocket. New costume pieces are made on request in order to keep Fernand's morale high. According to my findings, in-house costumers are currently hard at work making Fernand a detective costume, a chef's hat, and a set of footy pajamas. Fernand is an indisputable charmer, greeting Foundation researchers with a wide smile, a joke, and more often than not, an invitation to join him for dinner. Unfortunately, those same staff members occasionally find themselves on the menu. In spite of all his endearing qualities, Fernand has the unfortunate habit of routinely snapping, giving in to his voracious appetite, and eating his visitors alive. He doesn't intend to do so, and frequently expresses regret at his poor manners. After all, Having company for dinner doesn't mean you eat your company, but still he can't help himself, no matter how recent his latest meal was. Though I have yet to confirm this hypothesis, I believe this cannibalistic impulse to devour others may be the reason for Fernand's constant clenching of his teeth. Whether consciously or not, I think he is attempting to hold off on attacking for as long as he can, before he inevitably succumbs to the hunger once more. When his gums bleed, it could be a sign that one of his attacks is drawing near. Again, I have yet to confirm this, but it seems entirely possible. 
it's unlikely that Fernand will ever be able to verify this for himself, as his connection to the truth is tenuous at best. Though he is highly intelligent in terms of his memory, puzzle-solving skills, and grasp of language, Fernand struggles to differentiate between fact and fiction when consuming media. He assumes that any movie or television show he watches is depicting a real person and that any book he reads is essentially a biography. This doesn't limit his enjoyment of this media. On the contrary, he gets a great deal of joy from watching films and reading books, particularly works of fiction revolving around Hannibal Lecter, who Fernand has described as his favorite person and someone he would very much like to meet one day. To make matters even more interesting, Fernand does understand the concept of lying. He's able to identify when someone is lying directly to him and also displays signs of being a compulsive liar himself, particularly when it comes to his personal history. Over the course of his containment, he is claimed to be a vampire, a homunculus, beloved Sesame Street character Big Bird, also beloved actor and wrestler Andre the Giant, Napoleon Bonaparte, French comic book character Obelix, the Foundation's own Dr. Bright, the Incredible Hulk, Alexander the Great, Captain Hook, and Detective Sherlock Holmes. He has also claimed, at different times and once on the same day, to be both Dr. Frankenstein and Frankenstein's monster. When called out directly on these lies, Fernand offers only this explanation. But I only lie when it's through my teeth. Which I have to admit, is pretty funny. SCP-082, Fernand, is currently contained in enlarged living quarters in armed biocontainment area 14. As he is unfazed by most standard weaponry, his cooperation has been ensured through deception rather than physical force. Fernand has been led to believe that he is acting king of France, placed in a secret palace for his own protection from potential assassins. Any personnel that interacts with Fernand must address him as if he were, in fact, the king of France, and any deviation from the charade is met with swift discipline. Any housekeeping done in 082's containment area must be performed by Class D personnel only, as it poses too much of a risk to non-disposable staff. Guards assigned to SCP-082's containment will receive level 2 clearance but are not permitted to interact directly with SCP-082, no matter how friendly he is, no matter how many knock-knock jokes he tells them, and no matter how he tries to entice them into a round of karaoke. SCP-082 is a curious mix of congenial and threatening, the consummate host who loves to sing and cook for anyone willing to sit at his table. He's also strong enough to snap a spine in half and has teeth that can crack open skulls, a skill that he demonstrates with stomach-churning regularity. Still, he seems to genuinely enjoy the company of others and has an earnest, playful spirit. From his giving spirit to his diet, SCP-082 really gives a new meaning to the word humanitarian. If you ever have the chance to meet him, just be careful not to let your guard all the way down, because there's a fine, fine line between being his dinner guest and being his dinner. And the lights go out on Maple Street as a young woman takes stock of her marriage and the man she once thought she knew. She sits at the kitchen counter, absently stirring a cup of tea that went cold hours ago, but she just can't bring herself to stand and heat it back up. She glances at the baby monitor sitting next to her, grabs it, and holds it to her ear. Steady, peaceful breathing. The baby is fine. No one needs a thing from her right now. She stares at the seat across from her, where her husband sits every morning, sharing coffee and breakfast before they start the day. She glances at the clock. 8 p.m. He'll be home soon. She'll have to face him, have to find a way to look him in the eye, force a smile. Pretend she doesn't know that he's getting home two hours late from who knows where. The thought turns her stomach. It wasn't always like this. Their marriage wasn't always a tense charade, their home a haunted house. He was sweet that first year. He'd buy her flowers and take her out to dinner. He'd kiss her in the morning before they'd even brush their teeth. He wouldn't come home smelling like his secretary's perfume. But ever since the baby, something's been different. The light behind his eyes has gone dim. He won't help with late night feedings, won't change diapers. Most of the time, he acts as if the baby doesn't exist. His own son. He just comes home, stares vacantly at the TV, and expects her to handle everything without so much as a single complaint. She hasn't slept in weeks. She hasn't been down to her art studio in the basement in months. Then, a sound shakes her from her thoughts. She hears the unmistakable rumble of a car pulling into the driveway and fixes a stiff smile on her face. Maybe she'll leave him. Maybe tonight she'll work up the courage to say those words that will change everything. I want a divorce. The baby barely has a father now, what difference would it really make? The woman's husband stumbles through the door, lipstick on his collar and the smell of whiskey on his breath. 
He greets her with a kiss on the cheek, more out of obligation than anything else, and grabs himself a can of soda from the fridge. She offers him some stew from the stovetop. He brushes her off, saying, I already ate. She doesn't bother asking when or how, when he supposedly came straight home from work. There's no point. She knows he'll only lie. Do you want to say goodnight to the baby? She asks. It's a test, as she watches his face for any flicker of fatherly affection. Isn't it asleep by now? It. He calls their son, It. He's sleeping, but you could still go up and see him, if you're quiet. I had a long day, I'm tired, I'll see it in the morning. She can't help herself. Him. What was that? Him. He's not a thing, he's our child. He sets the can on the coffee table with a heavy clatter. Do you have to nitpick every word that comes out of my mouth? She deflates at the outburst. No. He sighs, shaking his head. Don't look at me like that. I can't stand when you stare at me like that. She averts her eyes, looking down. Fine. I'll go up and check on him. You enjoy your relaxation time. That's it. Tonight is the night. She's going to pack a bag tonight. She'll leave and start a new life, just her and her son. He won't even miss them when they're gone. It'll be better for everyone this way. She'll just go upstairs, check the baby, wait for him to fall asleep. Then she'll just cut and run. It's not like he deserves a proper goodbye from her. She can go away, go to her sister's place. As she fantasizes about leaving him, spending peaceful days in a little country house with her son and maybe a dog, she finds that the baby has spit up all over his pajamas. She scoops him up into her arms to make sure everything is okay otherwise, and he's fine, just a mess. As she holds him, he stirs awake and begins to cry. Oh, sweetheart, oh, I need to change you and give you a bath. Shh, sh it's okay, you're all right. What's wrong? Her husband's voice comes from the doorway, startling her. It doesn't concern you. She can't help herself. Her resentment creeps into her voice. He just needs a bath. What, you think I can't bathe my own son? <laughs> he scoffs. That's it? Well, you haven't done it yet. So, when she turns to look at her husband, there are tears in his eyes. I'll do it now. Something in his voice is so sincere, she falters in her determination for a moment. Maybe he'll really try. Maybe things will go back to how they used to be. And she really, really needs a rest. So she hands the baby over to him and sits down in the soft chair in the corner of the nursery. Before too long, the exhaustion overcomes her and she nods off. In her sleep, she can't see her husband leaving the bathroom to go downstairs and catch the last 20 minutes of the Dodgers game, leaving the baby alone in the tub. When she stirs awake, the crib is still empty. She can hear the water running and she knows. She just knows what has happened. What she let happen. No, what he did. A glance into the bathroom confirms her suspicions, and with a primal scream of pain, rage, and heartbreak, she tears down the stairs to confront the murderer himself. She finds him asleep on the couch and takes a moment to catch her breath, to wipe the tears from her eyes. Did he do it by accident or on purpose to punish her, to free himself from their marriage once and for all? to break her heart beyond repair. It doesn't matter in the end. What's done is done, whether he meant it or not. But what can she do? What could ever make this right? She wants to scream, to set the house on fire, to tear him to shreds. Then she spots it. The baseball bat leaned against the wall by the door in case of an intruder. She picks it up, feeling the weight of the wood in her hands, the heft of it. Swung hard enough with real intent behind it, it could really do some damage. Slowly, thoughtfully, she walks back toward the couch, raises the bat, and swings. It only takes one good hit to get the job done, but she swings the bat a few more times anyway as something inside of her bends and bends and breaks. Until the tears stop falling, until her vision comes back, and everything stops looking like a wash of red. He doesn't even scream never wakes from his stupor to see the look on his wife's face when she gets her revenge. He's just gone. She wipes the red from her eyes and lets the bloody bat drop to the floor. She started the day as a wife, as a mother, but now she's ending it as a killer. He deserved it, she tells herself. He took her baby from her, so she got him back. But why doesn't she feel any relief? Why does she still feel the gnawing grief in the pit of her stomach? feel the darkness clawing at her heart. First things first, she needs to get him out of the living room, out of sight of prying eyes and nosy neighbors. 
she could try to bury him. But where? The yard isn't exactly private, and she's not sure how much she could even dig up before sunrise. No, that won't do. Then the idea hits her, and she grabs him by the arms and begins dragging the lifeless body of the man she once loved toward the basement stairs. He's heavy, much heavier than she expected, but she supposed they called it dead weight for a reason. She grunts and struggles as she drags him down the stairs, wincing as his head bumps against the steps, before reminding herself, he's not using it anymore. She surprises herself with a laugh, a dry sound echoing in the empty basement. She drags him past the last chair, and he lands on the floor with a thud in the room that she converted into her home art studio when they first bought the house, back when things were still good. Her eyes dart about the room, the half-finished paintings, the wood carvings she abandoned when she got pregnant, the paints and long dried out lumps of clay, the potter's wheel in the corner. Her eyes settle on a metal frame, large and twisted into a vaguely human shape. She had crafted it years ago, intending to cover it with concrete and paint it, but never got around to it. No, she had been forced to put it away. Her husband hadn't liked it, had thought it was creepy and odd, and didn't want her working with such heavy materials. Just another thing he took from her, another dream he destroyed. It's just about his size, now that she takes a look at it with him lying limply on the ground so close by. With a little bit of muscle, some determination, he would fit right inside, and there are the tubs of cement, still sealed tight and ready to mix, just as she left them. She could shove him into the frame, paint him with layer on layer of cement, and it would be like he had disappeared in the night. A fitting coffin for the man, she thought. The perfect place to hide him, too. No one would ever know. No bones to dig up in the garden out back, no smell of rot seeping out from beneath the floorboard. She smiled to herself, just a little bit. In death, her husband would help her finish her greatest work. She didn't consider herself a wife or a mother, not anymore, but she was still an artist, and he would be her art. As she mixes the cement, she hums a little song to herself, beginning to feel something like peace. Everything is ruined, her life as she knew it completely turned upside down, but she is here in the art studio, creating again. Not a waste of time now, is it? She remarks to her husband's body. He doesn't answer. Typical. Why get an art degree, you said? Well, it prepared me for this, didn't it? Wonder what I'll do with you when you're done. Maybe I'll keep you down here. That seems like a waste. Maybe I'll get you displayed in a gallery. Let people buy tickets to take a look at you. You'll be my masterpiece. You'd hate that, wouldn't you? Me, thriving, creating. All without you there to make snide comments and treat me like dirt. As she waits for the concrete to become usable, she turns her attention back to the metal frame. Time to put her ex-husband in his place. She lifts him and begins to wedge his body into the metal structure. He's heavy, getting heavier all the time, and left a trail of blood behind on the floor that she would have to clean up and bleach later, but after several sweaty minutes, he is in place. He looks correct to her, sitting there in the frame, ready to become something new, something different, something better than he ever was in life. The concrete is ready, and she begins to smooth it over the body and metal frame, flesh and blood, and sweat and grit layer upon layer upon layer. Mix, smooth, wait, mix, smooth, wait. All the while she talks to him, weeps bitter tears into the concrete. At one point, she pricks her finger, her blood dripping into the mixture and becoming part of the sculpture. For days she carries on this way, not breaking to eat, bathe, or sleep. After three days pass, she runs out of concrete, but the sculpture is not finished. She'll need to go out and get more. She takes a shower, washing away the dust, the blood, and the guilt, changes into fresh, clean clothes, and takes a drive into town. She picks up more concrete first, telling the clerk some story about home improvements she's working on. He asks if she's married, if her husband will be helping with the work. I'm recently separated, she replies. On the way home, a small store catches her eye. It's a place she's driven by plenty of times, a little occult shop filled with herbs and tapered candles and strange leather-bound books. She isn't sure if she believes in this sort of thing, not really, but something makes her park and walk inside anyway. A gnarled old woman behind the counter spots her, and without speaking, points her toward a room in the back. It's different there, darker, filled with vials of thick, dark liquid, shelves full of skulls that might be human, though she isn't sure. In the back of the room, there is a bottle of paint, deep red and vibrant. What it's doing here, she couldn't be certain, but as soon as she sets eyes on it, she knows she needs to have it, needs to add it to her sculpture to make it truly complete. 
She brings it to the woman at the counter, but she just says, Take it. No charge. I can tell you really need it. Just be careful what you use it for. It's powerful stuff. She wants to ask what that means, what's so powerful about this little bottle of strange red paint, but she doesn't. She's much too exhausted and much too determined to get back home and put the finishing touches on her masterpiece. She drives straight home and hauls the concrete and paint inside, carrying it down into the basement. She's dizzy from hunger and lack of sleep, but she doesn't care. She has one singular vision right now, and she must see it carried out. She mixes more concrete and slathers the whole shape again, sculpting out the round, bulbous head, the arms at its sides, the legs and feet, the curve of the whole figure covered in thick gray sludge. In potential, a blank canvas. Before it dries, she opens the paint. It smells musty, rich, and somehow ancient. It clings to the bristles of her brush like a living thing and takes to the surface of the sculpture eagerly, spreading out as if of its own volition as she brushes it on evenly. She paints the whole thing, every inch of it. At first, it doesn't seem as if there will be enough paint to finish the job, but somehow that little bottle coats the whole figure in deep, dark red. She looks down at her hands, stained just as brightly as they were when she swung that baseball bat. She looks back up at her creation, the amalgamation of the fear, the pain, the heartbreak, the pure, primal rage, and begins to cry. The tears fall freely into her palms, and without thinking, she smears them into the concrete and paint until they disappear into the art. Then she takes a step back, watching it all dry. All of that work, all of that time, that great yawning chasm of loss, and this is what she has made of it. She loves it, and she hates it all at once, and she can't stop staring at the place where its eyes would be if it had them. She half expects to see something looking back. She shakes her head, looking down at the floor for a moment. Then she hears the sound of stone and metal grinding together. Her gaze snaps back up, and she sees that the sculpture has moved just a little, its head turned in her direction. In an instant, her husband's words come back to her. Don't look at me like that. I can't stand when you stare at me like that. It couldn't be. She stares at it for a long time, her eyes watering from the effort. She blinks. Her eyes open, and the sculpture is gone. There it is again, the grind of metal and stone against each other. Then, with the sound of bones snapping, everything went dark. Her hate, her vengeance, her desperate act of violence and creation, with a splash of the most unusual paint, led to the creation of a deadly masterpiece that would one day be known as SCP-173. It began, as most bad things do, with the evil mechanizations of one Dr. Evo Robotnik. This rotund mad scientist had been terrorizing the world of Sonic the Hedgehog and his animal friends for decades, with a single-minded task motivating his every diabolical action, getting his hands on the Chaos Emeralds and the Master Emerald that controls their power. This would allow him to strangle the natural beauty of the world around him and develop it into a cold, unfeeling world of machinery. None would survive his terrible wrath. The problem was, by this point, far too many people had, in fact, survived his terrible wrath. For many, many years now, despite a multiplicity of evil plans, Sonic the Hedgehog and all his cool, super-powered animal friends had thwarted him countless times. No matter how ingenious his plots were, no matter how many or how powerful robots he built to fight on his behalf, he would always be defeated, and it was starting to get extremely frustrating. It was in this state of near-maddening rage and spite that Dr. Robotnik created what would soon become his most dangerous and deadly invention, a trans-dimensional snatcher, a device that would allow him to reach into other dimensions and pluck out dangerous beings beings that would become living weapons, tools in his arsenal to fight that blasted hedgehog and all the others. Little did he know, he was about to tangle with a creature far more dangerous than anything he could ever hope to be. His mouth twisted into a devious grin, Dr. Robotnik stood in front of the trans-dimensional snatcher with his finger poised over a big, red button. Yes, yes, this would be the perfect plan. Sonic would never stop him now. He pressed the button and watched as the machine gave a mighty, almost blinding flash. As the resulting smoke cleared, Dr. Robotnik saw the creature he'd summoned cowering on the platform before him. It was gray and emaciated, shivering and weeping, covering its face. Immediately, Dr. Robotnik's face fell. Was that it? Some weeping, stretched freak? 
he wanted something more exciting, like a giant killer lizard or monstrous zombie that melts everything it touches. What could possibly be the combat potential of this pathetic creature? In his frustration, Robotnik kicked the cowering beast. It would be the last mistake he'd ever made, because the creature in question was, as you'd probably guessed, SCP-096. And as any SCP Foundation enthusiast knows, there are two ways to activate 096's infamous rage state. One is looking at his face, and the other is attacking him. Dr. Robotnik had just made a literally fatal mistake. As the crying turned into wails of rage, 096 leaped onto him, freakishly stretching its bottom jaw into a yawning black chasm of a mouth. Nearby, Sonic the Hedgehog, who was, of course, gliding along at the speed of sound, heard Dr. Robotnik's horrific screaming. He immediately recognized the scream as that of his arch enemy, and yet, the scream was so blood-curdling that even he couldn't deny it made him concerned for his old foe. Thankfully, it didn't take the blue super speedster very long to investigate the source of Dr. Robotnik's death rattles. He ran at hypersonic speeds until he reached Dr. Robotnik's base, where an eerie silence had now fallen. Sonic felt a chill in the air. With uncharacteristic caution, he began creeping through the metal halls of Robotnik's lair. Soon enough, he started seeing blood on the walls. Blood, but no bodies. What had happened here? Soon after, Sonic found out. He walked into the room that had once been the home to the transdimensional Snatcher, where the shy guy sat crouched in the middle of an empty, bloody room, weeping. Something about all this was terribly wrong. Sonic could hear it. That's when one of his feet clanked against the metal floor, and the shy guy looked up to view him. Sonic almost felt the breath leave his body when he saw that monster's horrible face. He'd never seen anything like it before. That's when the thought crossed his mind. Had this monster murdered Dr. Robotnik? As though activated by the sudden intrusion, the shy guy gave a monstrous wail, then lunged towards Sonic. Luckily for Sonic, his incredible speed came in handy here, darting out of the monster's clutches and whizzing out of the base. But despite his speed, the shy guy somehow still seemed to have an innate sense of Sonic's location. It began to bound after him, tearing its way through the walls of the base like tissue paper. It would slaughter the strange blue creature that had seen its face, destroy it, and leave nothing left. Meanwhile, Sonic was already speeding away. His greatest asset had always been his truly supernatural speed, but he couldn't run forever. And one look over his shoulder revealed a distant white dot behind him. It couldn't be, could it? He was moving so fast that the normal eye couldn't perceive him, so how could any living being possibly even be that far behind him? This monster really is built different, huh? He said to himself. The shy guy was gaining speed behind him. He couldn't even see Sonic, but he could sense his distant presence, the one who'd looked at him, the source of his rage. This strange little blue creature was certainly fast, but unlike Sonic, 096 was literally incapable of getting tired. The turtle always beat the hare in the end, and it would be the same here eventually. Sonic was smart enough to know that he probably couldn't beat something like this in a fight, especially if it had literally annihilated Dr. Robotnik. If he had any hope of beating this beast, he'd need to get some friends on his side before things went truly south. The person Sonic was looking for here was Tails, a flying two-tailed fox who was also one of Sonic's closest friends, who lived in the Green Hill Zone. Tails, Tails! Sonic yelled at breakneck speed. What's wrong, Sonic? Tails asked, visibly concerned. No time to fully explain. There's something after me, some kind of monster, Sonic said. Get everyone you can. We're going to need all the help we can get if we want to stop this thing. Before Tails could even get another word in, Sonic tore off again in the opposite direction. If this thing was following him, he didn't want to lead him straight to Tails. But the last thing Sonic was expecting was that the monster had somehow closed the distance, and now it was heading right for him. Sonic didn't even have time to course correct. A long, wiry arm shot outwards and whacked Sonic in the side of the head, sending him skidding across the grass. The shock of an enemy catching up to him like this rattled him even more than the pain of the hit, but there was no time to dwell. Sonic looked up from the ground and saw the shy guy barreling towards him, bellowing madly and digging its claws into the dirt. You just don't know when to give up, do you? Sonic said. Just before the shy guy's claws reached him, Sonic darted out of the way at the speed of light. Even then, the shy guy seemingly had an innate sense of his location. There was no way to trick or outrun the shy guy. It just kept running, no matter what. It was utterly relentless. 
If Sonic wanted to survive while Tails found reinforcements, he needed to fight back. Before the Shy Guy could lunge for him, Sonic lunged for the Shy Guy at impossible speeds, kicking the monster in the chest with both feet. The force of the kick, charged by super speed, sent Shy Guy rolling back across the dirt. Sonic hoped that this attack might incapacitate it, but no. The Shy Guy immediately rose to its hands and feet. It was ready to go again. For the first time in quite some time, Sonic was afraid. Thankfully, this time, he wasn't alone. The Shy Guy prepared to lunge when a spiked fist collided with the side of his face, laying the beast out temporarily. It was Knuckles the Echidna, a powerful pugilist who also acted as the guardian of the Master Emerald, the Chaos Emerald that controlled all of the other Chaos Emeralds. If Knuckles punched you, then you better believe you're gonna feel it. Tails called me. Is this ugly punk giving you trouble, Sonic? Knuckles asked as the Shy Guy began getting back up, its semi-smashed face repairing itself. You have no idea, Sonic said. Sonic and Knuckles were now taking on the Shy Guy two-on-one, making things a little more even, but they were still up against a ruthless, savage killer without compare. And now, Knuckles had seen its face too. The Shy Guy leaped forward, trying to grab Knuckles with its grasping claws. Sonic darted in just in time and grabbed Knuckles out of the way. As the Shy Guy grasped at the empty air, Knuckles jumped in and gave the screaming monster another mighty punch. The sheer force of it left the creature wobbling on its feet, but it still wasn't enough. Lucky for Sonic and Knuckles, they were about to get some help from the big guns. Literally. Bullets suddenly perforated the Shy Guy's body, distracting the monster. It turned and saw yet another one of Sonic's allies, Shadow the Hedgehog, wielding a customized M16 assault rifle. He was wearing a devious smirk. Oh, Sonic, he said. When will you learn that your actions have consequences? Having attacked the Shy Guy, Shadow the Hedgehog was added to his kill list. It seemed he was making a lot of new enemies today in this strange new place. But there was still one more ally left to come. Suddenly, the Shy Guy felt a presence behind him, as though someone had just teleported there. It was a purple creature, similar to Sonic, though far more extreme, named Cold Steel the Hedgehog. He was wielding a desert eagle in each hand. Huh, nothing personnel, kid, Cold Steel chuckled. Before the Shy Guy could make another move, Cold Steel turned and unloaded the magazines of his two pistols into the Shy Guy, while Shadow provided suppressing fire with his M16. Meanwhile, Knuckles kept punching at the monster, and any time the Shy Guy attempted to attack one of them, Sonic sped in and pulled them out of harm's way. They were a perfectly organized team, and soon enough, the Shy Guy was temporarily incapacitated. Looks like he's down, but not for long, Sonic said. It's time to finish this. That's when Tails descended, his arms filled with the last thing they needed to conclude their terrifying ordeal, the Chaos Emeralds. And with the help of Knuckles' Master Emerald, they could send this abomination back to wherever it came from and never worry about it again. With the power of the Chaos Emeralds, there was another almighty flash, just like the one that had brought the monster here. When the smoke cleared, the monster was gone, returned to the place from whence it came. Sonic sighed and said, well, at least we don't have to deal with Dr. Robotnik anymore. It's not every day that the SCP Foundation opens a brand new site and appoints a new site director, but today is one of those days. Work is about to begin at Site 41, and a respected senior researcher has been appointed director of the brand new site. He hasn't been told much about it yet, but he knows a few things for certain. Some sort of new, highly volatile anomaly was discovered, a site was constructed around it, and his many years of loyalty to the organization have finally been rewarded with a promotion. As he takes his morning shower, his mind races, turning over the possibilities that this new chapter might bring. Is he up to the potential challenges? Just how dangerous is this new anomaly? What could possibly necessitate the building of a brand new site just to contain it? Whatever it is, these years of securing, containing, and protecting have prepared him. He's seen bizarre creatures, cursed places, and objects that defy the laws of physics. Whatever awaits him in his new position, he can handle it. He rinses the shampoo from his hair, letting his jitters flow down the drain with it, and switches off the water. He climbs out of the shower and turns to the foggy mirror. He sweeps a palm across the glass and meets his reflection's eyes. His serious expression catches him off guard, and he can't help but let his mind wander back to someone else who looked at him that way, with those stony gray eyes such a long time ago. He and his brother had never gotten along. Though they shared the same face, the same hair, and the same eyes, they couldn't have been more different. 
He was the screw-up, the one who couldn't focus in class and was always bumbling through life like a bull in a china shop. His brother was the golden boy, the star student who could do no wrong. As the boys got older, he tried to climb out of his brother's shadow and tried to live up to their parents' expectations, but anything he did, his brother could do better. He got into a great college, his brother got into Harvard. He got a job, his brother got a more impressive one. He got a Honda, his brother got a Mercedes. He fell in love with a girl, and his brother married her. It seemed like he would never stand on his own, never be anything but the lesser version of a perfect man, a nasty little homunculus who just happened to be wearing the graven image of something greater than himself. On the night of his brother's wedding, the festering resentment had finally come to the surface. He remembers the night in bits and pieces, a harsh word, a fifth drink, a broken champagne glass. His brother said something that went too far, cut too deep. Without thinking, he shoved him just a bit too hard. He watched his brother fall, watched his head hit the corner of the table, and then he was still, silent. He thought about turning himself in, but then another thought crossed his mind. Why ruin two futures at once? His brother was gone. There was no coming back from that. Should he really spend the rest of his life in prison over a tragic mistake? It didn't seem fair. Instead, he planned. For once, he was grateful for the similarities between him and his brother. Their handwriting, for instance. He forged a note to his brother's new bride, telling her that he couldn't take the pressures of his life anymore. He was leaving, fleeing to Europe to start a new life, with a new name, and leaving all of his old ties behind. Then he packed his brother's body, the one that looked so much like his own, into a suitcase. He drove out into the woods, to a place they had once gotten lost as children, and he buried it so deep, no one would ever find it. He'd never forget how he felt that night, laboring away in the dark forest, face an unpleasant mess of snot and tears, the end of his shovel piercing the dirt again and again, until he'd made a big enough hole to consign the case that now held his own brother's mangled body. Every shovel full of dirt that he piled back on, hiding his sin, felt heavier than the last. What had he done? What the hell had he done? But by the time the grim deed was concluded, rationalizations had smoothed out the hard edges of his crime. There were a million reasons this was okay. This was justified. It was an accident, of course, that much was clear. But didn't his brother also have it coming, for flaunting his perfect life in his face for all these years? And who was the worthless chunk of dead meat now? The scales were balanced once more. No one would ever know what he did. No one but him, in those moments where he could see his brother in the mirror, reminding him of his greatest shame, no matter how hard he tried to forget. But that moment is long gone. He's back in the present now, grounding himself with a splash of cold water on his face. He shakes off the memories and dresses for the day. It's time to get to work. When he arrives at the facility, he's shocked by what he sees. It's a castle, grand and imposing, even if the years have not been particularly kind to it. The Foundation did not build this structure, though they've set up shop inside now. His reminiscence has made him late, and he hasn't even had a chance to look over his paperwork yet. But when you're a site director, what does it even matter if you're a little late? You're the boss, the head honcho. The party doesn't start until you walk in. Just the thought of it is enough to make his chest swell with pride. He will have to ask someone to fill him in, an eager subordinate who won't mind going over the basics of the new facility and what they are here to study. Like clockwork, a young assistant researcher scurries up to him, holding a clipboard and practically vibrating with energy. She clearly hasn't been working here long. There's still light behind her eyes. He thinks to himself, the things you see here will snuff that out soon enough, my dear. The assistant researcher leads him inside the castle, its guts ripped out and replaced with sleek modern technology. A stone staircase has been swapped out for a row of elevators, marble busts exchanged for security cameras and monitors. They enter one of the elevators and the assistant presses the button for the lowest possible floor. They are going deep into the bowels of the castle, into the belly of the great beast. With a ding, the doors open and they step out. The air down here has a peculiar smell, musty and dull, with a sharp metallic tang of dried blood. Along the wall, he can see a row of prison cells, eight of them to be precise, all shut tight. They're rusted and old. They've been here for quite some time. The foundation didn't put these here. Of course, he realizes with a sinking feeling in his stomach that he can't quite explain, these cells themselves must be the anomaly he's here to supervise the containment of. He should have read the file before arriving, shouldn't have let himself get distracted, then he would know what he's walking into. So here we are, the assistant chirps, startling the man. He had almost forgotten she was standing next to him. Shall I give you the grand tour? She won't last long here with such a chipper attitude, he thinks. 
but he nods just the same. She walks ahead of him, referring dutifully to her clipboard as she goes. This is the first cell. As you can see, all of them are currently inactive. We'll be performing some tests later, though, and you'll hopefully get to see them in action. It's really something. She continues walking to the second cell. There are a lot of potential applications for this anomaly that, once we understand it, could be incredibly promising. He's only half listening as he trails behind her. As they near the third cell, the assistant glances back at him. I really look forward to working with you, sir. I've heard such great things. He opens his mouth to brush off the praise, to feign humility for her sake. When a sound startles him, the grind of metal against metal, the screech of a long disused door, the third cell is opening on its own. The assistant flips through her notes, growing pale. This isn't supposed to happen. This shouldn't be happening. She stammers, but he barely hears a word. He's staring, transfixed, at the darkness within. There's a rattling sound, like chains being dragged across a stone floor. What is about to be unleashed from this prison? He braces himself, remembering all of the near-death experiences he's faced down in the past. Nothing could prepare him for what finally appears. A pair of iron shackles, attached to lengths of chain, shoot out from the shadows, headed right for him. A shackle clamps suddenly around each of his wrists, the cold metal tight enough to cut off the circulation, digging into his skin. Then, an invisible force on the other end of the chains begins to pull. He fights it, the shackles cutting into him as the assistant screams for help, but his efforts are futile. Whatever wants to pull him closer, whatever is trying to lock him away, it's far stronger than he could ever be. The chains yank him inside the cell, and the door slides shut behind him with a crash. He thinks for just a moment that he can see his brother laughing. Then, he's gone, leaving only an empty cell and a traumatized assistant behind. Sometimes the sins of the past come back to haunt you, and unfortunately for this particular man, there's no statute of limitations when it comes to SCP-567 or The Dungeon. In case the nickname wasn't clear enough, The Dungeon is not the sort of place you would ever want to be confined. SCP-567 is a series of eight cells located beneath Foundation Site 41. Each cell has a designated number from SCP-567-1 through SCP-567-8. Most of the time, the cells are inactive and indistinguishable from any ordinary prison cell. However, when someone that one of the cells deems to be guilty of a specific offense enters their proximity, the anomalous properties of SCP-567 become abundantly clear. Each cell punishes a specific horrible act. SCP-567-1 targets those who have committed theft. 2. Punishes sexual violence. 3 and 4 punish various types of murder. 5 punishes adultery, 6 and 7. I'm afraid I can't quite make out what it says. Someone appears to have deliberately scratched out the text in the file. As for SCP-567-8, whatever wrongdoing it chooses to penalize is still unknown, and it is never activated in the entire time the Foundation has known of it. Every other cell is completely empty, but 567-8 contains one single, antique wooden chair in the center of the room, nailed to the floor. The purpose of this chair is unclear. When an individual who has committed one of the aforementioned acts comes within 2.5 meters of their corresponding cell door, a pair of shackles will shoot out from within the cell, seemingly materializing out of nowhere. These shackles will then lock around the individual's wrists and drag them inside, at which point the cell door will slide itself closed and locked, and the prisoner and shackles will disappear. Multiple researchers have compared this anomaly, both in its function and its methodology, to SCP-1002, or Demisers, and SCP-2701, or True Solitary Confinement, which I have discussed at length before. Since the Foundation first contained SCP-567, only two prisoners have ever reappeared after being taken. 68 hours after he was first placed inside SCP-567-3, D-903912 escaped and was found collapsed on the ground just outside Site-41. He died only moments after reappearing, before any medical intervention could take place. An autopsy showed severe injuries, including lacerations, internal bleeding, and burns on his wrists and ankles. The second subject to ever return was D-937122, who was found 157 months after being locked in SCP-567-6. In spite of her injuries, which included head trauma, missing fingers, and the same burn marks on her wrists and ankles, this subject had a great deal more energy and attempted to attack the Foundation personnel that found her. She was subdued by several guards, restrained, and interrogated by an unnamed agent. Thankfully, an audio log of the interview was included in the file, giving us a sense of what transpired. 
Please state your name. The agent began. D-937-122 did not respond. Please state your name. They repeated. Again, no response. The agent sighed heavily and changed tactics. Look, I'm very sorry and I want to help you. But we can't give you medical attention unless you cooperate with us, so please, please state your name for the record. At long last, the D-Class responded with an intense outburst. My name? You want to know my name? Screw my name! There is no name! There is no anything! But, but there is. I escaped. I got the medal off. None of the- And here the audio was corrupted to the point where I couldn't understand what was being said. After the interference clears, D-937122 could be heard shouting, I should be free! Let me go! A struggle followed as she attempted to escape custody. The agent then replied in an attempt to calm the D-Class down, I apologize, but now we have the opportunity to- Screw your opportunity! There is no opportunity! There is only escape! You called me a monster. Maybe I am one. But the nightmares, they- She briefly broke down into unintelligible mumbling before returning to normal speech. Compared to their crimes, I've done nothing wrong. Nothing at all. I haven't done anything wrong. Nothing. At this point, the D-Class became inconsolable, all coherent speech dissolving into sobs. The agent attempted to calm her down, but she remained hysterical. After several moments of sobbing, the D-Class began to gasp as if she was having difficulty breathing. She clutched her chest and began to go into apparent cardiac arrest. The agent attempted to administer CPR, but it was unsuccessful, and after a few minutes, she was dead. An autopsy was ordered following the interview, which revealed the apparent cause of her death. Her body was covered with tiny punctures, and a toxicology report revealed an unknown poison in her bloodstream. Though only two people have ever emerged from SCP-567, they were not the only organic life forms to break out of the dungeon cells. Every so often, the doors of a cell will open, and an entity will emerge. These creatures are given the designation SCP-567-9, and they are always aggressive. They do not usually match the description of any existing animal, instead appearing to be some sort of undiscovered creature. Once an instance of SCP-567-9 has escaped its cell, it will attempt to leave the dungeon and attack anything that gets in its way. The first instance of SCP-567-9 observed by the Foundation was a four-limbed creature approximately two meters in length. It walked on all fours, but had human-like hands on its front limbs, complete with opposable thumbs and sophisticated enough mobility to operate machinery. It was highly intelligent and used this intellect to take out 14 Foundation operatives before it was contained. The details of SCP-567-9-2 have been stricken from any official documentation. The only thing I can surmise from the file is that nine personnel were killed after it appeared, and one of the agents that helped contain it requested and received psychological counseling for what they experienced during the process. So whatever it was he encountered, it wasn't anything good. During a round of routine testing with SCP-567-4, while the cell door was open, an instance of SCP-567-9 appeared, attacking and killing the researcher leading the tests. The entity was not contained, but after seven casualties, was lured back towards its original cell. At this point, the cell deployed its shackles, and the creature was pulled back inside. The most recent instance of SCP-567-9 emerged when the door to SCP-567-7 opened and closed spontaneously. This was spotted on the CCTV footage, but none of the security monitoring the video could see anything leaving the cell. Two weeks later, an agent assigned to the dungeon was found dead in his home, still in bed. The circumstances of his death were virtually identical to those attributed to SCP-966, a nightmarish species of creature known as the Sleep Killer, which I've discussed here on the channel before. When the escaped entity was found in Site-41, it was found to resemble an instance of SCP-966, with only a few variations. It was successfully contained, and the on-site security cameras were upgraded to prepare for future anomalies like it. Though many specifics are missing from the file, including the exact appearances of the creature that emerged from the cells, I have deduced one thing. Wherever SCP-567 is transporting those it deems guilty, it is a prison for monsters of all species. Humans are not the only ones it wishes to hold accountable for their crimes. As I was reading about the dungeon and the various tests involving it, a rather morbid question came to mind. What would happen to a test subject guilty of more than one crime? Which cell would claim them? Well, fortunately for my curiosity, and unfortunately for him, one D-Class found out. D-834200 was used as a human test subject during initial studies of SCP-567. He was placed in front of SCP-567-6 and 7. Almost instantly, the cells rattled open, 
and the shackles shot out to grab him. His left wrist and ankle were ensnared by cell 6, and his right were trapped by cell 7. Then, he was pulled into both cells. Well, part of him was at least. How can I best explain his fate without causing too much distress? Have you ever held a wishbone in your hand at a family dinner while your sibling or cousin held the other side, and you both pulled until it broke? It was a bit like that. SCP Foundation Site-41 has been established in the abandoned castle that contains SCP-567 in order to prevent any civilians from coming across it. The entrance to the dungeon is kept sealed at all times, and the doors to each of the cells are monitored via CCTV. If any door is opened without authorization, Task Force Delta-9, also known as HACKS, will be deployed to contain the resulting instance of SCP-567-9. If, for any reason, it cannot be contained, the Task Force is permitted to terminate. In order to prevent the unnecessary loss of any personnel, all applicants to join Task Force Delta-9 must have a clean criminal record, have never committed a crime at all, even at the behest of the Foundation, have a strong dedication to the law, and show loyalty to the social contract and the feelings of others. A robust moral compass is considered a vital qualification to work near SCP-567, lest they become simply one more victim added to its long list of tortured penitents. The Foundation has encountered many anomalies over the years that could pose a danger to the organization itself. SCP-567 is no exception. Untold numbers of Foundation operatives have committed terrible acts in the service of the greater good. They have lied, stolen, and even killed in order to protect and contain the secrets locked away in files and behind heavily guarded walls. A great deal of caution should be used when dealing with the dungeon, no matter how justified a person thinks their past sins might be. After all, there's no chance to plead your innocence, and the very prison that plans to hold you is also the judge, jury, and executioner. The rain patters incessantly against the hiker's hood, the sound that has been accompanying her for the last four hours of walking through the Blue Ridge Mountains. Just that noise and the squelch of her shoes as they tread their way up the gravel path. It doesn't help that it's now almost pitch black. Come to Blue Ridge. You'll love it here. We can go out together. Yeah, right. Her friend had bailed on her at the last minute, taking half of their equipment with her so the hiker had to buy herself a whole new tent and sleeping bag that morning. Now, as she trudges her way up yet another trail in the pouring rain, she seriously wonders if it was worth the trip out to Virginia. She is so absorbed by the rain and the darkness that she fails to see the man walking towards her until the last second. He isn't coming along the path, not at all. Instead, he is marching straight up the ridge on her right, making a beeline for her. He is dressed in ragged waterproof clothes that catch and tear on the bushes as he pushes his way through them. He closes the gap to her startlingly fast, so quickly in fact that she has to jump back out of his way to stop him from walking right into her. She catches her heel on a rock and loses her balance, landing squarely on her tailbone. A dull ache shoots up her torso, enough to wind her. But as she gasps for air, the man just walks right on past. He crosses the path and strides up the embankment to the left, disappearing into the woods without so much as a glance back at her. By the time she's got the air in her lungs to call out at him indignantly, he's long gone. Her breath doesn't fully come back, though. Some part of her feels rattled. As she gets up, feeling that familiar squelch in her boots, and continues along the trail, she can't quite settle her lungs into their normal pattern. She walks another mile or so, but the anxiety doesn't go away. That settles it. She won't camp on her own tonight. There's a hostel just up the ridge that she can go to. It might be quiet because of the weather, but there will at least be some company there. The last thing she wants is to be a woman camping alone with a strange man marching around the woods like that. Safety in numbers. And numbers there are. As she approaches the hostel, she spots a small gang of tents surrounding it. There is a little canopy outside with an open fire underneath. Rain-bedraggled campers huddle around the flames like a group of waterlogged moths. Their brightly colored raincoats are draped heavily over their shoulders, lit up eerily by the orange glow. The nearest guy, in a blue coat, waves her over and explains that the hostel is already full. Apparently hikers have been flocking to the building all day to escape the rain. Some of them are too exhausted and wet to say a word, just heading straight inside and sitting in a bunk. They are packed in there like sardines, apparently. Definitely a fire hazard. The smell in there, he explains, is unbelievable. She has probably dodged a bullet being late and having to camp outside. A girl from the group gets up and shows the hiker to a good spot, raised slightly above the puddles that threaten to turn the grass into a swamp. The hiker thanks her and starts to set up her new tent. It goes terribly. She's never set up one like it before. Whoever designed it had clearly never gone camping in the rain. The inner has to go up first before she puts the outer rain cover over it, 
So right away, her room for the night has been drenched in rainwater. Perfect. She throws her bag inside and hurries back over to the fire, eager to get out of the rain for a bit. There's quite a crowd gathered around the fire. They mostly just sit in silence, only a handful of campers keeping the conversation going. Many of the strangers don't say a word at all, just sit there staring into the flames. The hiker does the same for the longest time, just enjoying the feeling of having her hood down, the warmth at her wrinkled fingertips, and a bit of human company around her. After what feels like an hour, the guy in the blue coat asks if anyone wants to hear a ghost story. Immediately, four different people start yelling at him to stop being such a cliché. They're grown adults. Surely they can have a normal conversation around a campfire at night without having to reach for such low-hanging fruit. They can't. A woman starts things off. She talks about a boy from her school who'd gone missing up in these mountains years ago. On the night of his junior prom, he'd skidded off the road and down a ravine. No one ever found the body. Then, as if by magic, he'd appeared at his girlfriend's house on the following year's prom night, dressed in the same clothes he'd gone missing in. But when her parents came to wake her up in the morning, he had mysteriously vanished. No one finds it particularly scary. Someone else jumps in with a story of his own. Similar theme, really. A cousin had a friend who knew someone who owned a kayak that he'd capsized on some rapids. Ten years later, he turned up at a campsite in the middle of the night, and so on and so on. Safe to say, none of the ghost stories are any good. The hiker stops listening, staring into the flames and letting her mind drift. She can't help but let her mind drift back to the man from earlier. The hiker shudders involuntarily. One of the campers around the fire asks if she's okay. She tells them it's just the rain. That man. Something had been seriously wrong with him. Dressed in tattered waterproof clothes, walking in such a straight line, totally ignoring her. Not just ignoring her, but nearly walking through her. Should she tell someone? Maybe he's still somewhere out there. Maybe he's sick. She should say something. The hiker sits herself up straight and looks around the circle. She's just opening her mouth to speak when she freezes. There he is. The man, sitting two places to her left. How had she missed him? Rain drips from his hood and runs down his sleeves. He isn't looking at her. He isn't looking at anything, just staring straight ahead at something beyond the fire. Is everything okay? The guy in the blue coat asks, noticing the hiker's discomfort. She gathers herself and tells him everything is fine, but the interruption is enough to kill the conversation. An uneasy atmosphere settles over the campfire. No one knows quite what to say. The only sounds are the crackle of the campfire and her breathing. She can hear it speeding up again, her lungs falling out of rhythm, out of sync with her body, in sync with her growing panic. Is he following her? It's too much. The hiker excuses herself and gets up from the fire. She walks in the direction of her tent, but with every step, she finds her lungs falling further out of rhythm. Breathe in, breathe out. Simple as that. One breath in, one breath out. In through the nose, out through the mouth. Is he behind her? Is he? She wheels around. No. No, he is still sitting with the crowd staring into the fire, just like the lady next to him and the young kid next to her. In fact, half of the people sitting around the fire don't seem to be moving at all. In fact, none of those people looking into the fire have said a word all evening. Not a laugh, not a smile, nothing. And come to think of it, there must be 11 of them sitting around that fire, but there are only five tents set up out here. A figure emerges out of the darkness so suddenly it makes her jump. He can't be more than a few feet away from her, but in the darkness, she would never have guessed he was there. This new stranger walks straight past her, over to the fire, and takes her empty spot. No introductions, no asking if that space was taken. He just sits down. Quietly as she can, the hiker walks back over to the group, careful to hang back just out of the flickering glow of the fire. She watches as the newcomer takes the exact same pose as the others sitting around the fire, blank expression, staring straight ahead. The guy in the blue coat welcomes the new guest. No response. He puts an arm around the stranger. Nothing. He asks if he's okay. Had a long day? Silence. The concern seems to register on the guy's face, and indeed on the faces of the others sitting around the fire. Or rather, on half of the faces of those sitting around the fire. The other half just carries on staring into the flames. The faces. There's something strange about their faces. Their skin it isn't just rain-soaked and cold, it looks slightly bloated, sallow, like a thin layer of plastic wrapped too tightly around a piece of meat that had been forgotten about. All of a sudden, the guy in the blue coat stands up sharply. I'm going to bed, he announces in a slightly choked voice. I... Then he runs, scrambling away from the fireside and out into the rain. The hiker catches up to him and grabs his arm. 
He wheels around and stares at her with wild eyes, looking her up and down, then pulls away, heading for the door to the hostel. From behind her, the hiker hears the others from around the fire all getting up to leave too, and this time it really is everyone. Even the strangers with their bloated skin, everyone is getting up. She turns back to Bluecoat and implores him to let her come and stay in the hostel for the night. She doesn't feel safe out here anymore. He just shakes his head at her, mouthing noiselessly. His eyes lock with something over her shoulder. She spins around to see the stranger, the newest one to join them at the fire. He's right behind her, inches from her face. The smell hits her. It isn't overwhelming, but it is there, sure enough. The smell of rotting meat, barely making it to her nostrils as if it was seeping through the gaps of a closed dumpster. The stranger does not look at her, though. He raises a lazy arm and pushes her out of the way, eyes fixed on the door to the hostel. Bluecoat drops all pretense and starts running for the door. He reaches it, dives inside, and slams the door hard behind him. The stranger continues to walk to the door, all the way to the doorstep, then stops. Another of the strangers joins him. Then the stranger with the tattered waterproofs. Then the others. Seven figures standing by the doorway, not knocking, shouting, or doing anything at all. Just waiting patiently, as if at any moment someone will come and let them in. The hiker stands motionless. She holds her breath. Maybe they've forgotten that she's here. She glances around back over to the fire. The others seem lost as to what to do. All of them are right on the verge of running, only there's nothing to run from. The strangers aren't doing anything. They aren't even looking at them, just waiting by the door to the hostel. The hiker, still holding her breath, creeps over to the group. Three girls, including herself, and two guys. They all exchange silent looks of fear with one another. Maybe they're overreacting. Maybe these strangers don't speak English. Maybe they're just exhausted from the wet weather and acting strangely because they've become a little delirious. Maybe it's all just one big prank. Maybe, maybe, maybe. For a long time, they stand like that, the five of them huddling near to the fire, the strangers waiting by the door to the hostel. No one speaking, no one moving. The fire sputters and shrinks the longer they stand there. The strangers remain totally still. Creepy? Yes. But nothing bad has happened. No one is being attacked. No one's in danger. Maybe they are overreacting after all. Tiredness sets in. It must be 2 a.m., maybe 3. Would it be crazy to just go to bed? Those strangers, odd as they are, are not actually doing anything. And it's so dark and so cold. Maybe if they just get into their tents and go to bed, everyone would be gone by the morning. So that's what they do, agreeing with their plan in hushed whispers. The hiker volunteers to go last. The others all get their things and disappear into their tents as she stands to watch. None of the seven strangers by the door move. They just wait there patiently, expressionless, slightly bloated, waiting to be led inside. Finally, it is her time to go to bed. Quickly as she can, she unzips the door and ducks inside. The zip is loud, much louder than she expected. Stupid new tent, so loud that as she closes it behind herself, she sees the stranger in the tattered coat turning to look at her through the closing gap. Then nothing. She's on her own. Finally. She's holding her breath again, and through what she thought were impenetrable canvas walls comes a sound, just audible over the pattering rain. Footsteps. A shadow falls over the tent. The zipper slowly drags its way open. The rainy wind blows in, carrying with it the stench of rotten meat as the stranger crouches down and crawls into the tent. There isn't space in there for the both of them. He crawls virtually onto her lap, his face inches from hers, looking right at her, but not seeing her at all. Now she is breathing hard and fast, shallow breaths that rack her lungs and send her whole body into convulsions and heave that horrible smell into her nose. More footsteps. The whole tent lurches to the side as another one of the strangers crawls in, stretching the canvas out to the left. He puts a heavy clammy palm directly onto her arm, absently pinning her down. Once he's in, just like the other stranger, he just stops and waits. A third one forces his way into the tent. The hiker is now lying flat on her back, half pinned down. There's nowhere left for her to go. There is physically no space left in the tent. There's no air to breathe, nothing but these strangers. Footsteps surround her, yelps from the other tents, zips opening, poles bending, then silence. Nothing but the patter of rain as the five campers lie there, closed in by these seven strangers. Breathe in, breathe out, breathe in, rotten meat, breathe out. The hiker lies there totally still as panic attack after panic attack racks her body as the strangers in her tent do nothing. Time warps out of shape. She has no idea how long it has been, but every so often, a new set of footsteps will march themselves purposefully up to the entrance of her tent, and a new shadow will join those encircling her. How many are there now? 
She can count them by the light of the fire. Nine, 12, the counting gets easier. Somehow the fire is growing steadily brighter, brighter and brighter, until she can feel the warmth of it even from here. But no, it's too bright, too warm. That can't just be from that fire. Besides, no one out there is feeding it. Then the screaming starts. Just a few muffled yells at first, rising to blood-curdling shrieks within seconds. Within a minute, the sound of a roof collapsing. Sparks land on the tent and sear little holes into the material. The hostel. It's burning. The hiker wants nothing more than to break out of the tent and run to help, but the strangers surround her, doing nothing, just pinning her down, motionless, stinking. She blinks. They're gone. The pressure on her arm isn't there anymore. The shadows on the fabric are gone. Just the light from the fire remains. That and the smell still wafting in the air. The hiker gasps for air and receives a lung full of smoke. She throws herself forward and out of the opening in her tent. It is too late. The hostel burns fiercely, just as the morning sun crests over the horizon and the last droplets of rain fall at her feet. That morning, the hiker found herself standing right in the middle of SCP-1102. You see, this particular anomaly is not a creature at all, as you might have expected, but rather a region. Within the Blue Ridge Mountains in Virginia, USA, is a geographical area known for a disarming but ultimately harmless supernatural occurrence. Well, mostly harmless. Only occurring at night and during periods of rain or snow, a seemingly random area within the Blue Ridge Mountains will undergo a strange event. All of the corpses within that region will seemingly come back to life. This is no simple reanimation, however. The original bodies do not suddenly rise out of the ground. Instead, exact copies of those bodies appear. While these copies are close enough to the original person to fool observers from a distance, they fail to be all that convincing upon closer inspection. The skin is the biggest giveaway, looking somewhat deteriorated and different in color from the original person. The most obvious difference, however, is the behavior. Corpses created during an SCP-1102 phenomenon lack full brain function. While studies have found flickers of activity occurring between the neurons, it is nowhere near enough to sustain intelligent thought. These bodies find themselves driven by one simple and very human desire. They want company. Any corpses, human or otherwise, will seek the nearest crowd of their own species and gather with them. Beyond this drive, little is known about their motivations. Once with the group, they do not feed, reproduce, seek dominance, or even offer any social interaction. They just return to their nearest point of civilization, simply to be there. Until all of a sudden, they aren't there. When the sun rises after an SCP-1102 occurrence, every walking corpse simply disappears, along with the original corpse that it was copied from. Not a trace is left behind. Unless, of course, you happen to get that smell trapped in your brand new tent. And this brings us to what was most unfortunate about the incident up at the hostel in the Blue Ridge Mountains that our hiker bore witness to. The fire that started had nothing to do with SCP-1102. All that happened was our friend in the blue coat felt so afraid of the stranger standing outside that he sat himself right up against one of the hearths inside, close enough for the edge of his coat to catch fire. While the whole building did burn down, rescue services only found eight bodies inside, far from the maximum capacity the hostel offered, almost as if everyone else crowded inside that building had mysteriously vanished. Of course, keeping an SCP like this one away from the public eye is no small task. Containing a seemingly random geographic phenomenon is virtually impossible without sealing off the whole mountain range. Instead, a group of dedicated agents has spent several years running an information operation instead. Taking the truth of these events and dressing them up as cliched ghost stories, the kind you tell around a campfire. So next time you sit across from someone toasting a marshmallow and telling you about a friend they once had, it might just be worth paying attention to. You never know who might be on their way to join you. What was that? The man and woman's hike through a gently rolling portion of the Rocky Mountains has just taken a turn for the dangerous. There's something there in the bush, the man tells her before stepping in front of her in a defensive pose. They watch the bush intently. There's a slight rustling of the leaves as if something is inside. The man picks up a stick from the ground and holds it in front of him, ready to strike whatever fearsome beast is lurking in the underbrush. The rustling stops but the man doesn't move from his protective stance. Do you think it's gone? The woman asks. The man isn't sure. He leans in towards the bush, searching for signs of what might be hiding inside when, ah! The man screams and falls backwards as the creature emerges from the bush. Aw, the woman cries. It's a pika. 
She kneels down to get a closer look at the adorable little creature. Pikas are native to this part of Colorado, and they resemble rabbits but with small, rounded ears. She watches it hop back off the trail before turning around to see her friend lying tangled in the branches of a tree. She can't help but laugh as she offers a hand to help pull him out of his predicament. Are you alright? She asks between fits of laughter. Yes, he's fine. The only thing hurt was his pride. He notices a small red spot on his arm and rubs it, but it doesn't seem to hurt at all. His attention is diverted by the woman, though, who is marveling at the tree he was just stuck in. Free of the branches, he can appreciate now that the tree really is incredible. It looked like a huge blue spruce, but the name is a complete misnomer, because this tree is a vibrant red color. I've never seen anything like it, she says, and the man hasn't either. Neither knows what species it is, and, strangely, there don't seem to be any others like it. Maybe this is the result of an odd genetic defect that turns blue spruces red. After admiring the tree for a moment, the pair decides that they've hiked far enough and that they should probably head back to the car. She jokes that he's likely exhausted from his run-in with a wild animal, and he laughs, but clearly his ego has been bruised. The man stops his car in front of the woman's house, and she thanks him for taking her on the hike. As she starts to get out, though, he stops her. He asks if she wants to go do something else, like dinner? The woman thanks him for his offer, but she has to be up early the next day for work. Just a quick drink then? An hour? Thirty minutes? The woman tries her best to let her friend down easy, explaining that she likes him as a friend and as only that. The man opens his mouth to respond, but she stops him. If he valued their friendship, then he wouldn't try to take advantage of it by using it as a backdoor to dating her. The man again looks like his pride has been shattered. He apologizes and admits that she is right. It's just that he has such a good time with her that he never wants it to end. She gives him a sad smile as she closes the car door, and he watches her enter her house before he finally drives away. It's two weeks later when the man's phone rings. It's his friend. She explains that she's been thinking a lot about what he said in the car and that she likes spending time with him too. Maybe there could be something more to their relationship. The man can't believe it. Is this really happening? The woman is serious. She'd like to take him up on that dinner offer, if he's still interested. Her treat. She wants to know what he is doing right- Ah! The man suddenly yelps in pain. Is he okay? What was that sound? Yes, I'm fine, it was nothing, the man tells her. It's just that now… now's not a good time. The woman doesn't understand. She thought he'd want to see her. She explains that she's leaving town for a work trip the next day and will be gone for a couple of weeks. She was hoping she could see him before she left, but… The man cries out in pain again. He tells her that he hasn't been feeling well all day, but that he'll be alright. Okay, well, get well soon. I'll call you when I get back. They exchange goodbyes, and the man hangs up the phone. The man looks terrible. His skin is pale, and his face looks hollow and gaunt. He looks down at his arm and sees that the veins themselves appear to be moving, pulsing, and vibrating. He screams again in agony and falls to the floor, clutching his arm. After writhing on the floor, he manages to summon the strength to reach for the phone. His hand searches on the table above him, and eventually he's able to knock it onto the floor. He grabs the phone and starts to dial. Nine. One. Before he can press one again, another wave of intense searing pain consumes him. Several weeks later, the woman is standing outside the man's house. Mail and newspapers are piled up on his front porch, as if no one has been in or out in some time. She knocks on the door, but there's no response. Hello? She calls out, but still nothing. She's very worried. She's tried calling him several times, but he never answered or returned her messages. She tries the doorknob, and to her surprise, the front door swings open. She steps inside and the room is dark. She's also immediately hit by a strong aroma of… pine? She searches on the wall and finds the switch. She turns on the lights, and can't believe what she sees standing in front of her. There in the middle of the room is a massive spruce tree, its upper branches pressing against the ceiling. She reaches out and touches the tree's vivid red branches. They feel sticky and wet. She pulls her hand away and looks down to see that it's covered in a red substance. That's when she notices something else. Stuck among the trunk at the base of the tree is the half-consumed body of her friend. Unfortunately, this pair would never have the opportunity to see their feelings take root and grow, because unbeknownst to them, this beautiful tree is actually a very deadly anomaly known to the SCP Foundation as SCP-867, but which is perhaps better known by its very appropriate nickname. 
blood spruce. SCP-867 is, or at least appears to be, quite similar to the species of tree Picea pungens, better known as the blue spruce. Of course, there are a number of dramatic differences between 867 and its non-anomalous counterpart. Visually, and most obvious, is the coloration. While blue spruces, as the name implies, are typically a blue-green color, SCP-867 is a deep, vibrant red. There's another major visual difference too, with the blood spruce lacking any sort of seed cones that you would normally expect to find. With no pine cones to protect and spread seeds, you'd be right to ask how SCP-867 goes about reproducing. The answer to that question is what makes this beautiful tree such a dangerous anomaly. The secret to how SCP-867 reproduces is found in its leaves. While they look like pine needles, SCP-867's leaves are, in fact, needles. Their structure is very similar to that of hypodermic needles, and each one contains a single long thin seed which sits above a small gas pocket at the base. When a living creature touches the leaves, the tree immediately reacts. It triggers the gas pocket in the base of the leaf to release, which injects the seed into the skin of whatever touched it. The process is quite similar to that found in auto-injectors, like those used to quickly treat allergic reactions. The seed itself is extremely small and is coated in a liquid that has both anesthetic and coagulant properties, which makes the process virtually undetectable. Once implanted in the skin, these seeds can lay dormant for up to two weeks before they begin the germination process and the true horror of SCP-867 is revealed. Once the seeds begin to sprout and grow, they will not seek to penetrate through the skin like a plant rising out of the soil. Instead, the strange plant will grow within its host's body, spreading throughout the circulatory system. This process is extremely painful for the host. The plant's tendrils wind through their veins and capillary system, stretching and pressing against them as the blood spruce grows within them. Eventually, the ever-increasing size of the plant's tendrils becomes too much and the veins will begin to rupture. This leads to severe internal bleeding and soon after, the death of the host. The entire process is quite quick with it only taking 24 hours from when the seeds first sprout to the host dying. But that single day will feel like an eternity to the afflicted individual as they feel the plant rapidly growing inside of their body. But even though the host has expired, this parasitoid tree is far from finished with them, or at least their body. Soon after death, a new instance of the blood spruce will burst from the body. The red tree is quite small at first, but it will continue to quickly grow just as it did within its host's body and can reach maturity in just 30 days. And unlike most other plants, SCP-867 is able to grow regardless of light or soil conditions because it does not produce food via photosynthesis. No, this plant is carnivorous. As it grows, the 867 will slowly consume its host's body until nothing remains except the blood-red tree. Instances of SCP-867 were first identified in Colorado during the 1990s, following reports of numerous disappearances of hikers and park rangers. The SCP Foundation dispatched a team to the area to investigate, and they soon discovered numerous instances of the previously unidentified tree. Several still young specimens were acquired, though unfortunately, this led to the deaths of several agents who were not yet aware of just how dangerous the red spruces could be. Once their threat level was properly assessed, Several specimens were flagged for containment and research purposes, while all of the other identified instances still in the wild were destroyed. The remaining instances of SCP-867 were classified as Euclid and are now securely kept at a Foundation biocontainment site. Direct human contact with the plants is normally not allowed and remote rovers are used for the majority of tests and upkeep. If for any reason it is necessary for a human to enter 867's containment cell, they are to wear full hazmat suits with a Kevlar underlayer, and upon exiting the cell must undergo a full herbicidal treatment and inspection. Should any possible puncture marks be discovered, they will be forced to quarantine for no less than 15 days. Ah, nature. It's so beautiful, peaceful, and calming, yet seems determined to try and kill us in any number of ways. If you're out hiking or camping in the woods, try to remember this extremely famous adage which I may or may not have just made up. It goes, Leaves of three, let them be. Needles of red, well, you're probably already dead. A storm rages outside of the little old house, as inside, a little old woman bounces a little baby on her little old knee. The baby coos and laughs as the old woman makes funny faces and noises for the child, trying to keep it entertained as they wait for his parents to return from their much-needed night out by themselves. The old woman herself needs a rest now, though. 
He's forgotten how exhausting it can be to watch a child. Okay, that's enough. It's time for both of us to take a little nap before your parents get back. She gets up and takes the baby into a nearby room that looks as though it was a nursery at one time, but it hasn't been used for many years. As she goes to set the child into the crib, a strong gust of wind blows through the room. She places the baby down and rushes to the window and closes it shut. It must have been left cracked open by mistake. Brr, the room is cold from the wind, but she has just the thing to fix that. She moves to a small closet and opens the creaky door. The little old woman strains to reach up to the top shelf and feels around. Ah, there it is. She pulls down a baby blanket, a soft baby blue with colorful animals printed on it. It looks as though it's been up there for a long time, and she gives it a good shake before walking back to the crib. Look what we have here. It's your daddy's own blankie. She gives it another shake. There we go, good as new. She leans into the crib and wraps the small helpless child in the blanket before giving him a gentle kiss on the forehead. Now you get some sleep. Your mommy and daddy will be back before you know it and we want to show them what a good babysitter Grammy is, don't we? That way I get to see you all the time. The little old woman switches off the light and exits the room, leaving the door cracked just a few inches. She heads back to the couch and plops down on it. Almost as soon as she does, though, the baby starts crying. With a sigh, she gets back up and goes back to the nursery. What's the matter, little dear? She says as she turns the lights on. Oh no, she rushes to the crib. You've kicked your blanket off. You must be freezing. She grabs the blanket from the end of the crib and tucks it around the baby once again. There you go, that's better. The old woman leaves the room and quietly closes the door shut, leaving it open just a few inches. The moment she turns around to go back to the couch, though, the crying starts again. With a sigh, she opens the door and goes back into the room. Once again, the blanket is stuffed at the end of the crib where the baby has kicked it off. Fine, don't want a blanket, that's fine. She picks the baby up out of the crib and rocks him in her arms until it stops crying. She sets him back in the crib. There you go. No blankets. Just please get some sleep. Grammy's tired. The old woman takes the blanket out of the crib and leaves the room. She closes the door most of the way and, incredibly, this time the child remains silent. The old woman resumes her place on the couch and starts to yawn. Just as she does, the wind outside picks up and howls loudly. The old woman shivers. She looks next to her and spots the baby blanket. She picks it up and examines the cute animal print remembering when her own son was a baby wrapped in it. She smiles at the happy thought and throws the blanket around her shoulders. She leans back on the couch and finds that her eyes are growing very heavy. She'll rest them for just a moment. She won't fall asleep, she'll just rest. Mom, it's us, we're back. Thanks again for... The couple both scream when they enter the house to find that the old woman is lying face down on the floor in a pool of blood. The source of the blood is obvious. Chunks of flesh from her shoulders and upper back have been torn out, leaving jagged holes, as if she were mauled by an animal. As the man runs to the old woman, trying to do anything he can to help her, the woman runs to the nursery to find that the baby is sleeping peacefully in his crib. The woman picks up the child, tears streaming down her cheeks, and returns to the living room to see her husband kneeling beside his dead mother. Both the husband and wife are so shocked by what they have found that neither notices the baby blanket lying on the couch or that the cruel, blood-covered mouth on it is slowly fading from view until it disappears completely. There is little in life that is more comforting than a favorite blanket. Perhaps you've had the same one since you were a child, or you have a heavy one that you like to wrap yourself in when you're feeling down, or maybe it's just one that's especially fluffy and warm that you'd do anything to keep. Today's anomaly plays on those very feelings, using them against its victims to become one of the more insidious predatory anomalies in the SCP Foundation archives. This is SCP-799, also known as the Carnivorous Blanket. SCP-799 is a type of creature that can vary in shape, size, and appearance, but, as the name implies, always takes the form of a blanket of some kind. The exact material the anomaly is made out of is unknown, but it is a very soft fiber that in many ways resembles a high-quality merino wool blend though one that retains heat even more effectively than its natural counterpart. SCP-799's weight can vary from between half a kilogram all the way to six kilograms, and while examples have been found in nearly every color imaginable, it seems predisposed towards pastels and will frequently have patterns featuring stylized, friendly depictions of various animals. 
Both the pastel colors and the childish patterns are especially common in instances of SCP-799 that weigh less than 2 kilograms and would colloquially be known as baby blankets. While SCP-799 is undoubtedly a living organism, there is some debate as to whether it is itself an animal or perhaps a type of fungal colony. Instances of 799 are incapable of locomotion, lying motionless for long periods of time and require little in the way of nutrition. What small amount they do need, they appear to be able to gain almost entirely from the organic particles present in normal household dust, such as animal dander and dead human skin cells. The blanket feeds via a series of minute, filter-feeding mouth-like structures that are spread across the surface of the creature, which wait for nutrients to fall into them, not unlike a sponge on the ocean floor. Instances of SCP-799 can survive for quite a while in this state, and one specimen was noted as having lived for multiple years in a damp attic, subsisting entirely on the small organic particles that would drift down from the rafters above. Should an instance of SCP-799 be forced to go for long periods of time without a source of nutrition though, like when, for example, it is placed inside of a sealed closet or drawer, it will begin to undergo certain physical changes which result in it metamorphosing into its predatory form. These changes aren't noticeable from only casual observation and consist of the blanket converting its many filter-feeding mouths into a single, large one that is lined with multiple rows of extremely sharp teeth. The blanket creature also develops a new form of tissue inside its cloth-like structure, one that is similar to muscle and capable of contracting and squeezing. Once its metamorphosis is complete, the instance of SCP-799 will lie in wait for an unsuspecting creature to cover themselves with it or wrap it around their body. Once they do, the blanket will bide its time until they enter a state of rest, usually waiting for them to fall asleep entirely, at which point its feeding phase will begin. Once the creature has detected that its victim is dormant, it will use its newly formed muscle to latch onto them, holding them in place as it opens its tooth-lined maw. It will begin to bite at its confined prey, tearing off several kilograms of flesh, bone, and any other organic material it can, swallowing it and converting it into a thin slurry that it spreads through its body almost immediately. This traumatic, violent process nearly always leads to the victim dying of blood loss. Within 10 minutes of the attack, the mouth on SCP-799 will have been completely reabsorbed, leaving no signs that it is anything other than a normal, everyday blanket, though one which now mysteriously weighs several kilograms more than it did before. By 40 minutes after the attack, the entire digestive system within SCP-799 will have demetamorphosed back into its original form, with a single digestive tract being changed once again to the many dispersed filter-feeding mouths. While SCP-799 is more than happy to feed on any warm-blooded animal, including humans, it shows no interest in cold-blooded ones or inanimate objects. It appears, then, that its senses may be limited to only touch and heat, using those as signs that it is now wrapped around a potential meal. Adding to the strangeness of SCP-799 is that it reproduces through budding, like flatworms and corals. When it has absorbed enough nutrients and sufficiently increased its mass, either very slowly through filter feeding or rapidly via its carnivorous phase, it will begin to take on a quilt-like appearance. Over several weeks, one of the quilt squares will puff up and slide off the blanket. This new, smaller instance will resemble a doily or a throw pillow, until it too begins to feed and grow. The new instance is a perfect clone of its parent, identical in every way, and it will eventually grow to a similar size and begin its own reproductive cycle. It is unknown exactly how long it takes SCP-799 to reach full maturity, but the current best guess is that when kept in its filter-feeding phase, an instance will reproduce every 50 to 60 years. Instances of SCP-799 are quite prevalent across the planet, and the SCP Foundation currently has hundreds of examples in containment. Unfortunately, it is unknown just how many still exist in the wild, as it is very difficult to identify instances, with one of the only reliable means being through genetic testing. Should any instances be located, though, they are to be destroyed immediately, as the Foundation already has a large enough population in containment for research purposes, and they pose too much of a risk both in terms of harm and exposure to the general public. SCP-799 has been classified as Euclid, and each instance is kept in its own separate biocontainment cell at Biosite 66. Dust is regularly collected from the on-site D-Class personnel dorms and is sprinkled over the blankets regularly to keep them in their filter-feeding state, though only just enough to hopefully maintain their size and not allow them to reproduce. Should any small cloth objects appear in their containment lockers, it is to be removed immediately and contained separately. SCP-799 isn't the only predatory creature that resembles a cloth good in Foundation containment. 
and research into possible connections to SCP-1626, the oversized gray hooded sweatshirt that sends penetrating fibers into anyone unlucky enough to put it on, is ongoing. The Night Watchman's hand shakes, shuddering the beam from his flashlight. He can't believe his eyes. Never in all his time on the job has he ever expected to see something like this. It can't be real. It all begins earlier that night. The newly hired watchman arrives at the site of his new position, guarding a Chuck E. Cheese after dark. It seems a bit excessive, even he thinks so. After all, it's just a restaurant with some arcade games and admittedly creepy animatronic entertainment. Why would it need a dedicated person to keep an eye on it overnight? Sitting down in the security office, he sips his coffee in front of the old TV monitors. Grainy footage from all the building's security cameras flickers on screen. He stares at the display, but doesn't really see it. The night watchman's eyes glaze over. He's already bored. In his boredom, his mind starts to wander. He thinks back to the wanted advertisement for this posting. It had mentioned several reports of movement late at night within the restaurant. None of it made much sense to him. Who'd want to break into a children's restaurant in the middle of the night? Probably just some teenagers, he thinks. Suddenly, a loud noise startles the night watchman. The sound of something metal clattering to the floor. It's coming from the kitchen. Someone's still here. He grabs his flashlight from his belt and rushes through the restaurant, leaving just before a shadowy figure passes one of the security cameras. The night watchman clicks on the flashlight and starts to search, the light from it casting creepy shadows as it falls over the various robotic animals. They give him chills just to look at them. He can't imagine that kids ever enjoy seeing the characters flap their mouths to weird, annoyingly catchy songs. Another noise, footsteps this time. He turns towards the back of the restaurant, the kitchen, where greasy, unhealthy junk food is prepared for hordes of screaming, rowdy children. Stepping out of the dark but brightly decorated main restaurant area into the kitchen, with all its stainless steel work surfaces, was like suddenly arriving on another planet. Instantly, his flashlight falls over what had caused the first sound, a trash can, toppled over to allow someone to rummage around inside. There's a trail of garbage, and the night watchman follows it. It leads him around the parts of the building reserved for employees, only to veer back out towards the restaurant. The more he follows, the closer he gets to the play area, a brightly colored foam pen where overly energetic kids can run around freely, giving their parents a momentary break as they burn off all the sugar and calories from the low-quality food. But as he approaches the ball pit, he sees it. It's like an occult ritual, a circle of almost 20 children hurling slices of half-eaten Chuck E. Cheese pizza into the ball pit. Not one of them notices him, too focused on their strange ritual to even register the light from the flashlight. The night watchman is about to call out to demand to know what the heck is going on, how they all got in here and where their parents are. But then he sees something beneath the plastic balls. Something is stirring, moving in response to the children throwing pizza into the pit. And as it crawls out, the night watchman is met with the sight of something vile lurking in the ball pit. Stumbling upon what looks to be the secret meeting of a bizarre ball pit cult is hardly something that the average night watchman or security guard will ever have to experience. Even one working for an establishment like Chuck E. Cheese, the very worst they might find themselves dealing with, is particularly rowdy customers, or the restaurant's animatronic characters getting a little quirky at nighttime. But thanks to the SCP Foundation's investigations into this particular branch of Chuck E. Cheese, they've uncovered exactly what it is about the building that draws such unusual attention. You see, there really is something lurking beneath the ball pit, something now known as SCP-6059. Here at the SCP Foundation, the securing of anomalies is one of the core tenets of the organization. After all, that's what the S in the name stands for. And as such, the Chuck E. Cheese containing SCP-6059 had to be requisitioned. Fortunately, the cover story of the restaurant shutting down after a major health code violation seems to have been a believable ruse. And after all, it's not too far from the truth. You could say that the place does have something of a pest problem. Now that it's no longer a restaurant and arcade, the site serves as a foundation facility established specifically to research SCP-6059. Following some extensive analysis, researchers have determined what drew the cult-like group of children to the ball pit in the first place. It isn't an anomalous property of the building itself. There's nothing unique about this former Chuck E. Cheese franchise that causes such abnormal behavior. That all comes from the thing living in the ball pit. SCP-6059 is a particularly unusual creature, and not just to look at, 
although it's certainly not easy on the eye. In fact, it's been known to turn more than a few researchers' stomachs around the facility. Its amorphous body is around the size of an average human toddler, but if you were expecting it to resemble anything made of flesh and blood, then well, you might be disappointed and possibly put off your food. Structurally, the creature is comprised of a mixture of discarded and stomach-churning substances, primarily pizza sauce and plastic, along with various other waste materials. The plastic component is visible in the form of two of the plastic balls from the ball pit where it resides, placed on top of SCP-6059's blob-like head. Each one of those two plastic balls sports a hand-drawn pupil to resemble the creature's eyes, although no one is quite sure if SCP-6059 can actually see out of these or if they're more for show. Despite the strange and unnerving state it was found in, and being generally pretty unsettling to look at, SCP-6059 doesn't seem to be a violent anomaly. While not outwardly aggressive, it certainly doesn't reach the same levels of friendliness as other amorphous SCPs, such as the well-known and much-adored SCP-999, the Tickle Monster. But fortunately, especially for those researching it, SCP-6059 has come pre-contained for the SCP Foundation's convenience. What does that mean? Well, while it's not unheard of, not all anomalies come with their own containment cell. No, really, we aren't joking. SCP-6059 can't leave the ball pit. Despite the only thing separating it from freedom being a fence of thin, mesh netting and a pool of plastic balls that is only knee-deep, SCP-6059 is trapped. Although, that hasn't stopped the creature from claiming it is fully capable of escape. That's right, SCP-6059 can speak, too, and it has something of a high opinion of itself as well something that SCP Foundation researcher Dr. Zacharias Rosemary has discovered through extensive meetings with the beast of the ball pit. Dr. Rosemary is sent to the Chuck E. Cheese facility housing SCP-6059 at the behest of the Department of Anomalous Ambassadors. This is a specialized research division within the SCP Foundation that intends to improve the direct communication between personnel and anomalies themselves. And what branch would be better suited for learning just why SCP-6059 had its own following of devoted cultists when it was first discovered? Stepping inside the room containing the ball pit, Dr. Rosemary approaches the net barrier between him and the creature within. As per the instructions he has been given only moments before, Zacharias carefully opens the entrance, sealed with nothing more than a simple zipper. Dragging it down, he slips through and stands surrounded by plastic balls, reaching up to his knees. He calls out, knowing the anomaly can hear him, trying to get it to emerge and engage in a conversation with him. Sure enough, only a few meters away, the plastic balls of the pit shuffle and then part as SCP-6059 pops its amorphous head out from below. It greets Dr. Rosemary in an enthusiastic, almost accusatory way, demanding to know the answer to a strange question. Thing in my pit, are you balls? Of course, being a human being and not comprised of plastic balls, Dr. Rosemary has no choice but to answer the creature truthfully. But this doesn't go down well with SCP-6059. The creature immediately becomes highly agitated, shouting at the researcher to get out and leave. To emphasize its distress, SCP-6059 even starts gathering the plastic balls from around it and hurls them directly at Zacharias. If you've ever had a plastic ball from a ball pit thrown at you, then you know that it's hardly a pleasant experience. Although those balls are only lightweight, with enough force behind one, they can certainly pack a punch. Dr. Rosemary makes his hasty retreat from the barrage of plastic balls back beyond the safety of the net fence. Once he's out of range, the formless, messy face of SCP-6059 seems to frown before it disappears beneath the surface of the balls once again. Several other researchers and other personnel from around the site make their own attempts to converse with SCP-6059, met with the same reaction. It clearly doesn't feel like talking. But now that he knows the reaction wasn't unique to him, Dr. Rosemary is reassigned to try and get through to SCP-6059 again. This time, however, he's come prepared. Based on their brief encounter, the anomalous being seems to be childlike in its temperament and prone to misbehaving. So, Zacharias has devised a plan for his next interviews. If SCP-6059 starts acting out again, then the researcher intends to treat it like he would a disobedient child by putting the creature in a timeout. Heading back to the ball pit for a second attempt, Dr. Rosemary is also armed this time around. 
Well, with a family-sized Chuck E. Cheese pizza, at least. And it's not exactly a weapon, more of a peace offering to appease SCP-6059. Or a sacrifice. Passing through the mesh netting into the ball pit, Dr. Rosemary holds the box just above the surface. Almost immediately, SCP-6059 bursts out and chomps down on the pizza box, yanking the whole thing back down beneath the plastic balls to devour it. Zacharias tries to encourage it to talk again, and SCP-6059 makes no secret that it approves. You have appeased me with a sacrifice. You may speak, non-ball. Straight away, Dr. Rosemary wants to get down to business and asks the creature outright what it is, but the response is far from a coherent answer. Tell me, mortal, have you ever had an enlightened experience in a pit? Confused by what it means, the Foundation researcher tries to ask for clarity, but SCP-6059 has little to offer in that department. It seems obsessed with the contents of the ball pit, referring to the divine, higher power of the balls. Baffled and struggling to answer, Dr. Rosemary recounts an instance from his childhood where he got sick after playing in a similar pit in a McDonald's. This seems to be what the creature wanted to hear, judging by its response of, Yes, this is it. You have been touched by my blessing. You are a prophet of the pit. The anomaly apparently implies that it is some kind of deity, or at least, it thinks that it is. Capable of bestowing a divine blessing in the form of illness, which seems appropriate since SCP-6059 looks like it's riddled with germs. But Zacharias points out that the creature hasn't exactly answered his question. Hearing this, SCP-6059 seems a little confused, then pauses for a moment before hurling more balls at Dr. Rosemary and shouting again. He goes to leave the pit and warns SCP-6059 that if it doesn't behave itself, then he'll put it in a timeout. It responds by launching another ball and hitting the researcher right between the eyes. That settles it. The anomaly has earned itself a timeout. Putting his new plan into action, Dr. Rosemary shuts off the lights and leaves the room. SCP-6059 doesn't like it one bit, angrily throwing more balls at the mesh every few minutes, demanding that the lights be turned back on and that it be released from timeout. After a few short moments, it seems to settle and looks around in the dark for any sign of the researcher or any other members of personnel. Please come back. Now that he's shown the creature what the consequence is for bad behavior, Dr. Rosemary returns to the ball pit and sets out very clearly his expectations. It's very simple. As long as SCP-6059 behaves and cooperates, it'll receive pizza as a sacrifice. If not, should it decide to misbehave and act in a disruptive or disobedient way, then it will get put back in timeout. And surprisingly, the unruly anomaly agrees to adhere to these rules going forward. Their next interview begins much the same as the previous one, with Dr. Rosemary bringing another pizza for SCP-6059 to gobble up. He asks if the creature is ready to behave, to which it nods. Trying to be as amicable as possible, Dr. Rosemary explains that they got off on the wrong foot and that they're going to start over. He tells SCP-6059 to just answer his questions honestly, and the anomaly agrees to his terms. Then, the researcher asks again, wanting to know exactly what SCP-6059 is. I am Batulai, god of the pit. I hold divine power over the pit and all within. This hardly explains much, apart from confirming that SCP-6059 does think that it is some kind of god. Dr. Rosemary presses it for more information, and the creature responds by describing the pit and its many balls as its domain that SCP-6059 oversees. It implies that the ball pit can bestow blessings of some description, but the Foundation has confirmed that it's just an ordinary ball pit. Next, Zacharias decides to ask if Batulai SCP-6059 is the god of all ball pits or just this one, and comments that the creature hasn't made much attempt to try and escape its confinement. SCP-6059 seems to take this personally, insisting that it is more than capable of leaving the pit due to being all-powerful. Dr. Rosemary challenges it to do just that, to which SCP-6059 responds by reaching for one of the plastic balls. He urges the creature to make smart choices. Putting the ball back, it confirms that its domain is just the one ball pit it currently resides in. Dr. Rosemary pushes for more information, 
although SCP-6059 is reluctant to give answers. It needs some gentle encouragement, shying away when asked why this specific ball pit. But eventually, Zacharias coaxes answers out of the creature. It says it just woke up there one day. It came into being within the filth and waste lurking at the bottom of its pit. Then, Dr. Rosemary asked about the children. You see, SCP-6059 is the reason the strange cult-like group had gathered in the ball pit. It has the ability to spread some kind of influence that makes anyone under the age of 10 start to worship it. This usually occurs after around 20 minutes of being near SCP-6059 and leads to those affected to form a circle around the creature while praising its might and power, as well as throwing slices of Chuck E. Cheese pizza into the ball pit as sacrifices to SCP-6059. My divine servants, loyal subjects who sung my praises and brought me offerings, a god is nothing without followers. Followers spread word of your power and gain you influence. With followers, worshippers, you are remembered as mighty in the Pantheon. With worshippers, you gain offerings, and you live forever. When Dr. Rosemary asks why children, the anomaly describes feeling a kinship with them. It's not hard to see why, given the creature's tendency to misbehave and overestimation of its own importance. Seeing Zacharias taking notes, SCP-6059 asks if the doctor has become one of his supposed followers. After all, Dr. Rosemary has brought offerings of pizza and seems to be writing down stories about SCP-6059. I do not feel my influence working upon you, yet you perform the steps of worship regardless. Have you accepted the glory of the balls? Have you decided to become a follower of mine? Of course, Zacharias is just making notes of their interaction in the interest of research. He warns SCP-6059 not to overthink it, before wrapping up the interview, once again leaving SCP-6059 alone in the ball pit. The security cameras observing the creature's chamber record it becoming irritable at being left alone. It throws more balls at the mesh for several hours in an attempt to get someone to pay it attention. Come. Then, it sinks back beneath the plastic balls. The very next day, there is a significant difference in the following interaction between SCP-6059 and Dr. Rosemary. The creature actively requests to speak with the researcher. It wants to talk. Or maybe it wants the company, but can't quite articulate it. Agreeing to return to the ball pit as per SCP-6059's requests, although assuming the creature might just be wasting his time for attention, Dr. Rosemary is greeted with a confession. The anomaly explains it has been greatly bothered since their most recent meeting. SCP-6059 explains that, previously, it has been content with its domain, not wanting for anything other than the pit and the balls within. It was content, and it managed to garner a small cult of worshipping followers, but now it feels as if something is wrong. SCP-6059 continues, describing the time when it first awoke in the pit. Back then, SCP-6059 has a feeling a need for something. But it doesn't know what, and there is nothing it can do to stop this strange, unfamiliar feeling. All the newly congealed amorphous creature knows is that it is a divine deity. Around it is the ball pit, its domain. Eventually, the anomaly meets the children, and thanks to its influence, they begin to worship it. And it's their kindness and sacrifices that make SCP-6059 feel important. But once its followers are gone, and SCP-6059 is found by the Foundation, that same negative feeling returns, until it meets Dr. Rosemary. As the creature continues to explain, it describes how upset it feels to be left alone in the pit, and that speaking with Zacharias can alleviate that feeling. Then, when the researcher leaves, the feeling comes back. It confuses and upsets a bewildered SCP-6059, but offers some words of comfort and even another pizza. Dr. Rosemary explains that it's his job to take care of SCP-6059 and ensure the creature is okay. The anomalous blob rightly points out that he didn't have to come this time. After all, he could have ignored SCP-6059's request to talk. It wasn't required by the Foundation that Dr. Rosemary conduct an interview today. Zacharias puts it in simple terms that SCP-6059 can understand. 
He agreed to talk not because he has to, but to ensure the creature is all right and to learn more about it, but mostly because he understands SCP-6059 just needs a friend. To begin, SCP-6059 is unfamiliar with the concept. It's never had a friend before, only those that worship it because of its anomalous influence. Over time, the creature seems to have developed a sense of self-superiority because of this, believing itself to be a god. But Dr. Rosemary explains that a friend cares about someone not out of a need to worship them, but instead out of respect. Friends offer support or food or gifts to a friend in need, not out of obligation, but because it is the right thing to do. Zacharias tells SCP-6059 that friends listen to and care about each other not because they have to, but because they can. Are you my friend, Doctor? Naturally, Dr. Rosemary agrees, as long as that is something that SCP-6059 wants. In response, the creature playfully throws a plastic ball between the doctor's eyes. The 13-year-old boy gets a running start before leaping across from one moss-covered boulder to another. He barely makes the jump and turns around to admire how far he leaped. He continues along through the woods, hopping over streams and making sure to swing on any hanging vines he can find, whether he needs to or not. He picks up a branch and starts to swing it against a tree, engaging in a life-and-death duel with the evil knight of the woods. After slaying the knight, the boy solemnly salutes his fallen foe before mounting his trusty steed to ride deeper into the forest. He's all alone out here and must be thousands of miles from civilization. The valiant knight unmounts from his horse and walks towards the culmination of his quest, the Tree of Lost Memories. Legend tells that anything buried beneath this tree will cease to exist. All memories of anything associated with the object buried will disappear from the minds of anyone involved, and no one will ever bring them up again or wonder where the memories went. The knight takes a letter sealed with wax from where he was keeping it safely inside of his armor and kneels in front of the tree. He brushes the leaves and dirt away from a spot near the base of the tree and digs a small hole with his hands before placing the letter inside the hole. The boy looks down at the letter, satisfied with his work. He starts covering the letter inside the hole with dirt, when he suddenly stands up. Was that a noise? He listens again. It's not just a noise, it's a voice. The knight unsheathes his sword and starts making his way in the direction he can hear the sounds coming from. He follows a game trail through the woods towards the noise. There's no doubt, it's definitely a voice, and he can make it out clearly now. The wheel of history turns, and ages come and pass, leaving memories that become legend. The knight rounds a corner, and the woods open up into a clearing. In the middle of the grassy open area is a stone archway unconnected to any walls. When looking through the archway, though, one doesn't simply see the other side of the clearing. No, inside the archway is a beautiful white alabaster castle perched on rock overlooking the sea its red-roofed turrets jutting high up into the clouds. And standing next to the archway that seems to lead to another land is an old man dressed in a long flowing robe, a wizard's robe. The boy steps out of the woods into the clearing. What is this old man doing out here? And what's going on with this archway? It really does look like it is showing something it shouldn't be able to. Legends fade to myth, and even myth is long forgotten when the age that gave it birth comes again. Are you talking to me? The boy asks. Venture forth and face your true calling, the wizard responds. You are the one that has been prophesied, but have you what it takes to enter this land of adventure? The boy looks around. There's no one else here. This old man must be speaking to him, right? The boy tosses his stick to the ground and steps closer to the old man in the archway. He can see now that the surface of the archway appears to be shimmering as if it were a vertical surface of water. Only the truest of hearts may enter the magical archway, but for the fair and brave, a great quest awaits. A quest? For me? The boy asks, but again, the old man doesn't respond. He doesn't seem to be looking at him either. Is this wise old man in the woods blind? The boy gets much closer now, close enough to wave his hand in front of the old man's face, but there's no reaction. He really must be blind. The boy looks back at the portal in the archway. He can see the waves breaking on the rocks and birds flying in the sky. He can even make out, up in one of the highest windows on the tallest tower, what looks to be a… a girl. 
She's waving her ribbon in the air. She's beckoning him. She needs the brave knight to come save her. Pursue your destiny and become the hero you were always meant to be. The boy is entranced by the beauty of this land, the castle, the clouds drifting between the white towers, the perfectly blue sea, and the beautiful princess locked in her tower, waiting for him. The boy reaches his hand through the surface of the archway, and it passes through as if nothing were there. But on the other side, it turns into the gauntleted hand of a knight. He pulls his hand back out, and it looks like his own hand once again. The boy thinks about his mother, yelling at him for drawing pictures of the lands he wished he could live in when he should be studying. He thinks of his teacher grabbing the fantasy book out of his hand and dropping it in the trash, calling it a waste of time. He thinks of his friends laughing when he came to school dressed as a knight. He knew he was destined for something greater. And here it finally is. He really is a knight. He's the hero that was prophesied. He will become a legend. He's special. The knight girds himself and steps forward into the archway. As he does, he hears the old man still talking. The wheel of history turns, and ages come and pass, leaving memories that... The boy passes through the archway, and the castle, the sea, the princess, all of them disappear in an instant. The boy spins around, but the archway constricts, snapping shut in a tight ball with him still inside. The old man sinks to the ground as the archway seems to rotate, the archway then also disappears into the earth as something else emerges. A giant centipede appears out of the ground, its scaly body the color of stone with movable plates on its posterior end that resembles the movement of cloth. The centipede opens its mouth, and there's a sound like the cry of a child before it dives down and disappears under the dirt. Have you ever thought that you were destined for something more? Do you feel as if the worlds described in fantasy books and that are brought to life in movies and in video games are somehow the places you actually belong? You're far from alone, but be careful, because it's exactly those thoughts that make you the prime target for SCP-4310, a deadly predator that preys on those with the desire to embark on a hero's journey. SCP-4310 is an anomalous creature that resembles a common centipede in many ways, though it has a number of traits that distinguish it from the kind you might find under a rock in the forest. Perhaps most obvious is its size. While some centipedes can grow as long as a foot, SCP-4310 is over 20 feet in length. This massive carnivorous centipede, which is native to Great Britain and Ireland, also has a hunting method that is quite distinct from any arthropod, insect, or known animal at all for that matter. SCP-4310 hunts by cocooning itself in a pair of keratin flaps that cover its entire body except for its tail end, which is left exposed. The centipede then buries itself in the ground, keeping its head and the majority of its body under the ground, except for a portion that arcs above the ground in a semicircle shape, as well as its exposed posterior. The centipede's end resembles an old man wearing robes, and the centipede is able to manipulate its rear legs in a way that resembles the movement of a mouth and jaw giving the impression that the old man is speaking. The rest of its body is contorted, and the legs are arranged in such a way to resemble a stone archway standing unsupported on the ground next to the old man. Through a process that is yet to be understood by the Foundation, the centipede is able to produce a spatial anomaly in the area where its body is taking on the form of an archway. This spatial anomaly is actually a portal of sorts, a portal that leads directly into SCP-4310's stomach. As soon as its prey enters the spatial anomaly, the centipede closes the portal. Inside, paralysis-inducing enzymes incapacitate the prey as powerful stomach acids break down its meal over the course of several days. You may be thinking, I would never walk into an archway next to an old man in the middle of the forest, but SCP-4310 has two powerful mechanisms perfectly suited to luring its prey. First, it is capable of emitting a pheromone that induces a state of mild euphoria, while at the same time, suppressing fear and encouraging curiosity. This appears to affect all warm-blooded mammals, but humans and their natural inclination towards exploration makes them especially vulnerable to the effects. The second method 4310 utilizes to acquire food is producing a very unique set of sounds. These sounds, which are made by rubbing together portions inside of its tail segment, resemble English speech and are almost always phrases that describe quests, prophecies, and heroic deeds that can only be undertaken by journeying into the archway. 
SCP-4310 calls can last for as long as three minutes before they begin to repeat the series of heroic phrases, and each instance of SCP-4310 appears to have its own unique set of calls to embark on adventure, but with all encouraging entrance into the archway. It is unknown just how SCP-4310 learns these phrases, since other than this advanced hunting technique, no instance of the anomalous creature has shown intelligence levels above that of an ordinary centipede. Interestingly, the same heroic speech sounds appear to also act as SCP-4310's mating call, and it is unknown if the luring of would-be adventurers by the noises is merely a lucky byproduct or if it specifically uses the sounds for both mating and eating. SCP-4310 became known to the SCP Foundation in the 1950s following an investigation into multiple missing persons in Belfast, Northern Ireland. Agents searched a nearby forest and soon discovered human teeth in animal droppings concentrated around a wooded grotto. The grotto was excavated, and three instances of SCP-4310 were found hibernating beneath the ground. It's since been learned that after eating their fill, SCP-4310 will enter a hibernation state that can last as long as 10 years, and it appeared that these three instances ate well, since the remains of over 70 children were eventually found in the immediate area. SCP-4310 has been classified as Euclid, and currently, one instance is kept in a containment cell for observation and testing. The cell has been filled with a thick layer of soil resembling that found in the temperate forests of Great Britain, and once per week, five piglets are introduced into the centipede's enclosure. Mobile Task Force Lambda-12, codenamed Pest Control, is dispatched to areas where there are reports of old men resembling wizards encouraging people to step through a magical archway and the MTF agents are to exterminate any instances that they find in the wild. The Foundation's Department of Analytics also monitors all contemporary British children's and young adult literature, especially the fantasy genre, for references to portals in the woods that lead to wondrous locations, and Lambda-12 is alerted to any that may be inspired by, or referencing, real SCP-4310 instances. All of us fantasize from time to time about embarking on an epic quest that will allow us to escape our regular lives. While it is fun to dream about being swept off to another world, be very careful if you meet an old man in the woods who tells you that your quest begins with stepping through a magical archway, or you might just find that your hero's journey starts and ends in the belly of a giant centipede. It's October 31st, 2021, and anyone who's anyone in the upper crust of society knows that there's really only one place to celebrate Halloween if you want to stay relevant. A certain Norwegian billionaire's yearly costume ball Invitations are highly exclusive, and if you have to ask where you can get one, you're definitely not on the list. Those lucky, beautiful, famous, or just plain rich enough to be invited receive the notice a year in advance, in an increasingly elaborate fashion each time. Rumor has it that one year the billionaire specially trained a flock of purebred carrier pigeons to deliver the invites, printed on scrolls recovered from the ruins of the Library of Alexandria. But that's just a rumor, of course. This year's invitations arrived in the form of a luxury sports car, with a simple, gold-embossed card hidden in the glove compartment that read, Lucky You. It then provided information on this year's theme, Medieval Fantasy. The dress code would be strict, and failure to comply would result in being barred from entering the event. It also included a vital piece of carefully guarded information, the location of the party. The lavish event is held in the billionaire's castle, nestled in the remote countryside of Norway, which he had built a decade ago specifically for this one night a year. For the other 364 days, it sits vacant, except for a full staff to keep it in prime condition, of course. As a group of first-time partygoers pull up the long, winding driveway to the castle's gates, their limo is stopped by a guard. Your driver will need to let you out here, he explains. Can't have someone who isn't on the list coming up to the residence, your host insists. And so the group, two men and two women, climbs out of the car, and they all make their way up the drive on foot. They didn't prepare for the trek, and by the time they reach the castle gates, the ladies are sweating into their exquisite handmade gowns, and one of the gentlemen has torn a small hole in his tights. Nevertheless, they have arrived at what promises to be a truly grand occasion. Once the gates creak open and grant them admission, they quickly forget the discomfort of the long walk. Reports of the event have not, in fact, been greatly exaggerated. It is every inch as impressive as they could have imagined it would be. A lush golden carpet rolls out from the doors into the ballroom, and a herald clad in period attire blows a horn to signal their arrival. He announces their names to the room, where beautiful people are already dancing and frolicking to their heart's content. 
There are rows and rows of delicious-looking food, including roasted pigs, fresh fruit, and cakes. There are fountains filled with the finest champagne, and a full orchestra provides live music that fills the enormous halls. Above it all, the host himself sits, dressed in regal robes and a crown positively dripping with jewels. It is the most indulgent, decadent, glorious event any of them have ever been a part of. There are no clocks inside the party castle, and no other way to note the passage of time while inside. This is entirely deliberate, and an event there ends only when the guests have all grown too weary to continue the merriment. It is for this reason that the four newcomers do not notice how late it has grown, or the fact that one day has already bled into the next outside the castle. By the time they stumble back outside, filled with cake, champagne, and fresh gossip they can't wait to repeat, it is nearly dawn. They walk back down the path that led them to the castle, their steps a little heavier with exhaustion and the aforementioned champagne, and notice that there are rows of limousines and other cars waiting where they were dropped off. Excuse me, one of the women calls out to a guard. Where's our limo? Where did you tell him to wait? The guard responds. At this, the woman looks at her companions, who all shrug. None of them were aware of this practice, and they sent the driver home when they left the car. We didn't, she explains. The guard stares at her blankly for a moment, then bursts out laughing. Well then, he says, you'll just have to walk. Surely there is a contingency plan in place, right? Their wealthy host can't expect his guests to walk home if they didn't think to plan ahead and tell their driver to wait all night. The group waits for the punchline, the reveal that there is a driver on staff ready to give them a ride or someone who can call them a cab, but it never comes. Not only that, but none of their cell phones have a signal. They can't call the driver to come back, even if he wasn't likely to be dead asleep at this hour. The guard is right, they will have to walk, at least until they have enough of a signal to call for a taxi. So with no other option in sight, the disillusioned partygoers begin the long journey back to civilization. Light is beginning to trickle back onto the landscape, allowing them to at least see where they are going, but it is still mostly dark as they make their way along the road. Are we safe out here? One of the men asks. From what, muggers? The other replies. There could be bears out here, one of the women remarks. No, the other woman insists. The bears are all hibernating this time of year, aren't they? They all collectively shiver at the thought of encountering a bear or anything else out on this lonely road, with nowhere to hide and no way to defend themselves. Best not to dwell too long on that thought, or they might find themselves paralyzed with fear. They still have who knows how many steps left to go before they can relax. They walk together in silence for a long time, listening for the sound of any dangerous criminals or bears creeping up behind them, but nothing comes. As they slowly progress, the sun begins to emerge on the horizon, flooding the landscape with warm light and chasing away the fear of the dark. Look, one of the ladies finally breaks the silence. Up there! She points, directing her friend's attention to a hill up ahead. There, they can make out the silhouettes of men on horseback, wearing suits of medieval armor. They're dressed as knights, like something out of a King Arthur story. They must have come from the party. The others nod, agreeing. Maybe we could ask for a ride, one of the men suggests. Or to borrow a horse, the other chimes in. In agreement, the four approach the knights in shining armor, waving their arms as they go. Halt! Who goes there? Shouts one of the knights. Oh, there's no need for that, the other woman laughs. We came from the same place. Art thou friend or foe? The knight asks. He does not remove his helmet, his hand rests on the hilt of his sword. Thinking it all must be some kind of joke, the group of partiers continues up the hill. Spurred to action, the knight draws his sword, brandishing it threateningly. This is enough to stop the group in their tracks. Is he serious? mutters one woman to the other. I can't tell, she replies. That sword looks pretty real, though. Behind them, they hear the clip-clop of hooves and turn to see two other knights sitting atop massive black horses, brandishing weapons. I think we should go, she yells to her friends, gathering her skirts and running back down the hill, but the rest of the group don't seem so willing to turn back. You want to play a game? Then let's play, says one of the men as he draws his own sword, a perfect replica of one wielded by a character in his favorite fantasy television series, and tries to wave it back at the knight, but he promptly drops it on the grass. It's much heavier than he thought it would be. Leave this place now, or face your death, a voice bellows from above him. Now wait just a minute, who do you think you're talking to? The man says as he bends down to pick his sword up again. But before he can finish, there's a flash of glimmering steel in the sunlight, followed by a spray of dark red liquid that hits the rest of the partygoers. They watch in silent horror as the man's head rolls off his shoulders before looking back at the man on horseback. This isn't a game at all. 
The blood-stained partygoers turn and run from these frightening strangers on horseback, but they can hear the thunderous hooves following them, the clank of the metal armor. The woman who first began to run looks back over her shoulder and can't believe what she sees. It's a rout as the mounted knights chase their fleeing foes, cutting them down in their retreat. All she can do is run and hope that they're too distracted with their current quarry to come after her. She doesn't know how long she runs before the sound of the massacre starts to fade out, but eventually, it does. Unable to run any longer, she collapses in the grass, frightened and confused by all that has happened. But with a scream, she jumps to her feet once again as she hears footsteps behind her. You can't sleep here, says a man with a harsh barking voice. This is a restricted area. Before her stands the second group of armed men she's seen that day. This time, they're dressed in modern military attire. The Norwegian army? She can't be sure. The man doesn't have an accent. She starts to plead with the man, but he abruptly cuts her off. What year is it? He asks, his expression serious. She answers, confused, giving him the current year. He relaxes. This area is closed to the public. It's not safe for you to be here. Let me escort you out of the perimeter, he offers. She tries to tell him what she's seen, the strange men on horseback, her friends being slaughtered before her eyes. When the man asks how she got there, she lets the whole story come pouring out, the billionaire, the invitation, the party. In her frantic state, she doesn't notice one of the guards who radios to someone that it looks like he's done it again. The man questioning her changes his tone. He doesn't seem at all concerned about a murderous group of medieval knights in the woods. Sounds like you had a bit too much to drink, he tells her before putting a comforting arm around her shoulders. And she doesn't even notice the syringe until she feels a prick on her upper arm before losing consciousness. The woman would be returned home and have no memories of the events that she witnessed. She'd never remember how much danger she was in when she had a brush with SCP-526. SCP-526, also known as the Valhalla Gate, is located on a hill in Norway. The SCP Foundation has hidden information on the gate's exact whereabouts, no doubt to stop curious civilians from wandering into danger or filming short viral videos. But if you find yourself in the Norwegian countryside, it can still easily be identified. Simply look for a ring of nine stones, each standing at about two meters tall, placed in a 10 meter radius at the top of the hill. If you're not certain whether you're in the right place, or if you just happened upon another mysterious stone circle, look for the runes inscribed on the inward surface of each one. If the runes are there, you're in the right place. Or the wrong place, depending on who you ask. Every day at sunrise, give or take about 15 minutes, the gate will open and release a group of warriors from any point in history, fully armed and outfitted for battle. These can range from a small group of archers, to 300 Spartans, to groups of highly trained special operatives, and every member of the temporarily displaced group will be from the same period in history. As if they all ran through some sort of rift at the same time. Though these resulting manifestations rarely harm anyone, staying in place 92% of the time after they first appear on the hilltop, the remaining 8% lead to scenarios which can truly be a bloodbath. After all, to an army lost in the fog of war, emerging in a strange land in an unfamiliar time, anyone can look like an enemy. No matter how they behave on their initial appearance, those who cross through SCP-526 will attempt to attack anyone who approaches the anomaly. They will remain in the area until sunset, at which time they disappear, presumably returning back to wherever and whenever they originated. The SCP Foundation first discovered SCP-526 after a group of backpackers were hospitalized in the area. They claimed to have been walking through the hills when suddenly they were swarmed by, quote, a bunch of Vikings with axes. Naturally, this drew the attention of Foundation field agents, who soon found the mystical stone circle responsible for the attack. The survivors were given amnestics, and a cover story circulated blaming the claims of Vikings on recreational hallucinogens. Since this first incident, notable encounters between the Foundation and the soldiers traveling through the Temporal Gate have been few and far between, but there have been a few that were designated significant enough to be recorded in the official archives. Four, to be exact. In the 1990s, a member of the Foundation containment team spotted 40 figures making their way down the hill in the dim dawn light. They were holding longbows and swords, weapons at the ready as they made their descent. One member of the team, who it should be noted was on his very first day of containment duty, made the mistake of calling out to the strangers. Gentlemen, please lower your weapons, he called. His request, however polite it may have been, was answered with an arrow to the shoulder. 
Thankfully, the rest of the team was able to swoop in and settle things before the situation could progress any further. The injured personnel was given prompt medical attention and reassigned to a desk job, where he was much less likely to encounter flying projectiles of any kind. A few years later, the team of Foundation operatives placed at SCP-526 had started to grow complacent. There had not been a violent incident in ages, just a series of very confused people appearing at sunrise and milling around until they vanished at sunset. It seemed that most of the subjects passing through the temporal rift were not as bloodthirsty as one might expect. Then, one operative was startled out of a daydream by the thunk of a stone axe hitting a tree near his head. He and the rest of his team looked up to see a group of thirty men clad in animal skins pouring down the hillside, rushing right for them. In their fists, they held crude weapons carved from stone, their wild eyes, untamed beards, and blood-stained clothing becoming clearer as they grew closer. Fortunately for the SCP Foundation, these cavemen had brought clubs to a semi-automatic rifle fight. They opened fire, and within minutes, not a single hide-clad man was left standing. It was a bit awkward, looking at their fallen bodies for the rest of the day, but the team saw no point in moving them if they were just going to disappear that night anyway. One task force member spent the rest of the day looking at his hands, paranoid he may have shot one of his ancient ancestors and erased himself from the timeline in a back-to-the-future-like fashion. This was, thankfully, not the case. Several more years passed, and the century turned to usher in the new millennia. In the early 2000s, a platoon of 20 Russian soldiers, later identified when a Foundation officer attempted to translate several curses yelled at him by one of the men, materialized, wearing World War II uniforms and carrying rifles consistent with that time period. Most of them did not move from the hill, staying in a defensive position, but a few got a bit too bold and opened fire on the Foundation operatives. The fire was returned in kind, and two men were killed, but the rest were left unharmed for the remainder of the day. The final incident on record is particularly notable because, in this case, the soldiers that appeared did not belong to a particular country's military, nor were they from the distant past. There were thirty men and women, dressed in an uncomfortably recognizable uniform. These were the members of a lost SCP Foundation mobile task force, all killed in action during a field mission several years prior. Wanting to avoid friendly fire, the operatives placed at the site attempted to speak to these MTF members, but they did not respond. Instead, they attacked and would not relent until air support arrived in the form of a Foundation AC-130 gunship, Thor's Hammer, leaving three dead and eleven wounded when the smoke finally cleared. This last encounter raised some difficult questions about the nature of SCP-526 and the mental state of those who passed through it. They seemed unable to recognize their own peers, unable to hear what they were saying. Their instinct to defend SCP-526 from any perceived invaders overrode whatever familiarity or loyalty they might ordinarily have for other Foundation operatives. It was a tragic, disquieting affair, with no clear answers in sight. The SCP Foundation is of course no stranger to terminating its own, but the individual officers present for this incident reported a high rate of post-traumatic stress disorder, and several requested to be given amnestics in order to put a stop to recurring nightmares. The Foundation will not be able to learn more unless more of their own fallen soldiers pass through the gate. Even if they do, it is impossible to say whether they will be able to ask any questions or engage in a dialogue, or whether they will have to gun them down in another round of kill or be killed. Because there is no way to know what each new sunrise at SCP-526 will bring, the SCP Foundation has classified the anomaly as Euclid. As there is no way to move SCP-526 to any official Foundation site, the 15-kilometer radius around the anomaly has been converted into Armed Containment Area 31. The cover story for this area is a military weapon testing site, and there is a no-fly zone in effect there. A team of qualified field agents is placed on site in order to observe and neutralize any subjects that emerge from SCP-526. Because all is fair in war and, well, war. The agents placed there are permitted to use deadly force if their lives are threatened or the containment is jeopardized. Thirty minutes before the sun comes up, the containment teams are placed on full alert and will keep their eyes on SCP-526 until the sun has set and all potential threats have disappeared. If a given day's apparitions are too aggressive or too numerous for the teams on the ground to contain, Mobile Task Force Sigma-9, or Valkyries, may assist via airstrike. Since the Foundation has set up its perimeter around SCP-526, no civilians have been harmed. Though the same can't be said for Foundation personnel, or the revolving door of strange warriors emerging on the hill, the protocol has been considered successful. The car screeches to a halt, the door swings open, and the doctor tumbles out. He lands on his hands and knees in the dirt, and throws up the few remaining drops of stomach acid left in his system. He's put his hand in something sticky, 
he can feel an insect wriggling under his palm. Behind him, the door slams, and a pair of boots walk around to his side of the car. The translator accompanying him does not offer a hand to help him up. It had been a long car journey with many similar stops. Fortunately, this was the last. The doctor gingerly gets to his feet and takes in his surroundings. He finds himself in a small village hidden amongst thick trees. He's not sure what time it is anymore. The flights, time zones, and car journeys wrought havoc on his circadian rhythms. He knows he is in China, somewhere very remote and very rural. He tried to look it up with the maps on his phone during the journey, but he'd lost signal a long time ago. One thing is clear, however. It is the middle of the night. The car's headlights are the only light source in the village. No one comes out to greet them. The doctor brushes himself off and turns to his translator. The man nods towards a small hut near the back of the village, just beyond the headlight's reach. His translator is a man of few words, both ironic and deeply unhelpful. The doctor does not know a word of Mandarin himself. In silence, the two men approach the hut. The doctor reaches out to knock, but his translator has already pushed the door open. Inside, there is just the dim light of a lamp. Almost everything is covered in shadow. It is almost dark enough that they can't see the cobwebs. Almost. Silken strings drape themselves over every surface, wall, and item in the little hut. It's impossible in places to even see what item of furniture is hiding beneath all of the webs. The translator reaches out to touch one of the webs in fascination, but the doctor grabs his hand, shaking his head. He hands the translator a face mask and a pair of disposable gloves. Annoyed, the translator takes them, but does not put them straight on, choosing instead to walk deeper into the hut. After a second, the doctor follows, only he can't help the feeling that something's not right. Something's missing. Here, says the translator. It is the first word he's said in hours. He's standing behind a little curtain looking down at something, as the doctor joins him there and almost retches from the stench. Lying in the bed is an emaciated man. He looks like he hasn't eaten in days. His wrists and ankles are bound tightly to the bed, so tightly, in fact, that his circulation has been cut off. The doctor can see right away the telltale signs of gangrene spreading across his palms. But they're too late. The man isn't moving. His bony chest isn't rising or falling. Worst of all, he must have been dead for a while now. There are sheets of spiderwebs draped over his sallow skin, like some kind of deathly funeral shroud. The translator mutters something in Mandarin. It doesn't take a PhD to pick up on the evident frustration in his voice. A whole night of driving out to the middle of nowhere for nothing. The translator kicks over a wooden stool. The sound is muffled by the thick layer of cobwebs as he storms out of the hut. But something is wrong here. The doctor can't walk out just yet. Toxicology. That's his field. Poisons, toxins, infections, bites. But that's the thing. There are no bites anywhere on this man's body. Head to toe, under the layer of spider silk, there are no welts, bruises, or puncture marks. The only darkened veins standing out are on his fingertips as they rot away from stagnant blood. Nothing to do with poisons. But there's something else, too. A hut holding a dead body, full of spider's webs, but yet, no spiders. A scream fills the hut. The bed rocks violently. The doctor looks down in horror to see the dead man is not as dead as he'd appeared. He thrashes this way and that, straining against the ties on his limbs. The doctor calls out for the translator, who appears at his side almost immediately. The translator shouts something in Mandarin, trying to be heard over the dying man's screams, but it's no use. The man throws his head this way and that, trying to bash his chin into his own chest or hit the top of his skull against the nearest wall. It is no use. The man opens cloudy eyes that stare wildly around the room, searching for something, anything that could help him break free from his restraints. Without thinking, the doctor grabs the man's head and holds it steady. He peers into the man's weeping eyes. Bizarre. If he didn't know better, he'd say they almost looked as if they had spider's webs built up beneath the eyelids, clouding out the man's windows to see the world. Small, silvery balls of thick liquid gather in the corners of them, too dense, too murky to be tears. From somewhere beneath the haze, the man's pupils find the doctor's. In an instant, his body falls still. It is almost as if he relaxed, completely. A guttural murmur comes from the man's throat. The doctor looks to the translator for help. Free me. The doctor looks down at his patient. This is the part of medicine he had always hated the most. At what point do you let someone go? At what point do you say it's too late? Is it even right for him to make that decision? Looking at the man lying in front of him, a wave of sadness washes over him. His initial assessment had been right. It is too late. Even if he could treat the gangrene in the man's limbs with amputation, 
There's still starvation and dehydration to deal with. And then the apparent venom from the spiders. Except there are no signs of venom. Perhaps it isn't too late after all. With the right treatment, there may be a chance to... The man's wrist snaps, becoming a loose glove of broken bone that's easily pulled from the restraint. A foul stench of exposed rotten flesh hits the doctor like a slap in the face. He reels back in horror as the man pulls his other decimated hand free too. Unbound by his bed, the man lets out an animalistic roar. Sitting up in the bed, he tips his head back and starts pounding at it with what is left of his hands. Jagged wrist bones, barely housed by paper-thin skin, slam repeatedly into his forehead, harder and harder with each hit. The doctor is frozen to the spot, staring as the man smashes his own head. Skin splits, revealing white bone. Bone cracks. Then, with one last effort that seems to take every remaining morsel of the man's energy, he turns and crunches his fractured skull against the wall, caving the front half of his head in like a deflated basketball. Silence, more terrifying than any sound, fills the hut. The doctor stares at the body. An almost comical image pops into his head. The head looks like just a red plastic bag that someone had left on the floor, full of shards of broken pottery. He almost smiles. But then, the spiders appear. Just one at first, then ten, then a stream, then an eruption, spewing out of the gaps in the man's head like water shooting out of a collapsing dam. The tiny pink spiders flood the room, shooting up the walls into every crack and crevice, writhing and rippling around their feet. That breaks the doctor's paralysis. He and the translator sprint for the door. They crash through it and cover the length of the village in seconds. Grabbing the door handles, they haul themselves up into the 4x4. The translator slams it into reverse and almost crashes into a tree as he turns them around and back onto the dirt trail. They drive all through the night, not talking. The doctor gets control of his breathing, but his heart does not stop hammering the whole time. He cannot shake the images that fill his head. Spiders. Tiny pink spiders. Everywhere. The sun is just rising when the driver suddenly pulls over sharply. His eyes are wide, his face deathly pale. He doesn't say a word as he sits forward, reaches down the back of his shirt, and pulls out one tiny pink spider. The doctor yells in shock and hurriedly grabs a sample pot for the man to throw the spider into. The two men sit there in the front of the car in the warm morning light, staring through the glass at the arachnid. It looks soft. That's the most bizarre thing about it. Rather than having a hard, dark exoskeleton like other spiders, this one looks fleshy. No, that's not quite right. It looks fatty. It looks squishy like parts of the body that get exposed in traumatic crashes. Wrinkles and folds of pink, mushy cells with fatty deposits. Except it cannot be made from those kinds of things. It's a spider. As they watch, the spider seems to recognize their attention. It stands up on its back four legs and raises the remaining ones in the air. It looks almost as if it is doing some kind of mating dance for them. It turns its back to them, revealing a pattern of brightly colored dots across its abdomen. The doctor drags his eyes away from the dance. The sun is gone. Night has fallen again. His stomach stabs at him in hunger. But that can't be right. It was sunrise only a few seconds ago. The headache had started as he sat down on his flight. Now, five hours in and somewhere over an ocean, he knows he is not going to sleep tonight. He can't get the image of all those spiders out of his mind. He needs to report this. And he will, definitely. But not yet. A spider crawls up the seat in front of him. His heart stops, and he sits back violently in his seat, eyes wide. On the floor of the plane, pink spiders everywhere. They're not real. They're not real, just his imagination. He needs some rest. That's what he needs. He'll fly home, wait for the headache to pass. Then he can call someone. But right now, he just feels too groggy to do any of that. The adrenaline of his hallucination passes as quickly as it had come. He can feel the glass pot in his pocket tapping occasionally, begging for his attention. His head aches. He runs a hand through his hair. That can't be. Is he really growing gray hairs already? In frustration, he reaches up and taps at his forehead. Much to his surprise, the headache disappears almost instantaneously. If anything, it feels... good? He sits there for several minutes, drumming a couple of fingers against his forehead, and before he knows it, he's fast asleep, all his fears and anxieties long behind him. Only they are not behind him. Once he touches down, he goes straight home to his apartment. No spiders to be seen. Why not? Shouldn't there be more spiders? He certainly wants more spiders. His headache comes back, he drinks water, takes some medicine, goes for a nap, and turns off all of the lights, but nothing seems to work. 
Even the tapping stops working. More spiders. A call lights up his phone screen, an international number. He takes a long time to answer it. It's his translator. The man's voice is shrill, panicked, far beyond what the doctor had ever heard before, even when they'd been running from the spiders. The translator is not making much sense. His words are slurred, and his sentences stop and start seemingly at random. None of it makes sense. The doctor turns the volume on his phone down. It's too loud for his headache, way too loud. Government knows. Should have worn gloves. Too late. The pain. The pleasure. Using a hammer. None of it makes any sense. The doctor looks down at his phone screen. The call is gone. His phone is dead. Hadn't it been on full a moment ago? What time is it? And where are the spiders? He punches himself in the head. A smile spreads across his face. He's in bed now. Something red around him. His pillow. It is soaked red. Could that be from his head? The sample pot sits on his bedside table. Only now, it's empty. How did that happen? Wasn't he standing in the kitchen a moment ago? He's losing time. He runs a hand through his hair. Webbing clings between his fingers. He sits under his desk with a hammer in his hand, euphoria washing over his body. Just once more. Eight more times. He hits the hammer against his forehead. Endorphins flood every cell of his body, so powerful he almost passes out as the pleasure chemicals crawl inside of him, oozing silk through the pores of his skin. Webs hang all over his apartment now. Just one more hit. Eight more hits. That feeling, it's just so... His wrists, his ankles. How many limbs? Four. Not enough. That light. Where is he? Figures crowd around him. It is hard to see them. Something's in his eye. Everything looks blurry and far away. The pain. The pain is back. His head. Someone, please. He screams and pulls against the bindings on his limbs. The pain. It's... It's impossible. He needs to make it stop. Just one hit. Just one more hit from the hammer. That'll be enough. Something is behind his eye. He can feel it. Something crawling on the back of his eyeball. But that doesn't matter. None of it matters, except getting his pain to stop. No more headaches. Just one more hit. That's all he needs. The hospital staff have never seen anything like this before. They're out of their depth here. In the dead of night, they arrange for the doctor to be transferred to a specialist facility in the back of an ambulance. It is a challenge to get him out of his bed, as the spider's webs secreting from his skin have all but tied him to the linen. As fate would have it, a drunk driver gives the doctor his final wish. Not seeing a red light, the driver plows full speed into the side of the ambulance, sending it spinning off the road and down a hill, killing everyone inside, including the doctor. When police arrive at the scene in the early hours of the morning, they find the driver sitting on his own, staring at some small insect by the wreckage. The driver is unharmed by the incident. His only complaint as he spends the following night in police custody is that he feels a mild headache coming on. Anyone experiencing that headache is likely already too far gone from their exposure to SCP-632, an anomalous species of cognitohazardous arachnids nicknamed intrusive arachnid thoughts. Unconfirmed reports of mysterious spider colonies have been springing up across Asia, particularly in rural China, for several decades in connection with this anomaly. In 1972, the population of an unnamed town in the Anhui province were found to have been almost entirely wiped out. An entire town of corpses, each with their heads caved in, brain matter missing. With 106 dead, with 23 injured, this case is to this day the deadliest confirmed SCP-632 breach. Strange as it may be, physiologically speaking, SCP-632 could be considered cute. Their bodies are squishy in texture, bright pink, and are in fact made up of human tissue, brain tissue to be exact, coated in a layer of protective fat. As happened to our unfortunate doctor, SCP-632 reproduces parasitically within the human skull. The exact mechanics of this process remain unclear. It is believed that SCP-632 infects its human host through a selection of sensory triggers. Those infected have each testified to having been exposed to the following. Firstly, viewing the pattern on SCP-632's abdomen, exposed during the dance that the spiders often do under observation. Secondly, making physical contact with SCP-632. And lastly, through exposure to as yet unidentified chemical compounds secreted by the older SCP-632 instances. This is where luck was not on our doctor's side. He was smart enough to wear gloves during his encounter with SCP-632 in China, which may have been enough to protect him from being infected. However, upon his arrival as he fell out of the car, his hand landed directly in an SCP-632 web, housing a solitary live spider. If he had remembered his car sickness tablets, this could have all been avoided. 
Within three hours of initial exposure to SCP-632, the subject will start to experience mild headaches, followed by an uncanny sensation that their skin is growing silk. During this period, MRI scans have found that small filament-like structures start to form within the host's brain tissue. As these filaments multiply and spread throughout the brain, the subjects report developing an obsession with spiders. The brain tissue steadily deteriorates, leading to changes in personality and mood, as well as irrational behavior. Over the coming days, the headaches grow more severe as the filament cells press against the blood vessels lining the inside of the skull. Subjects find that they can relieve this sensation by tapping or hitting their forehead, replacing it with a pleasurable feeling as the filaments release endorphins upon impact. This is part of the sinister final act of SCP-632's reproduction. After six to seven days, as the host's headaches worsen, they find they have to hit their skull harder and harder to alleviate the pain and get that chemical high. Eventually, driven mad by the pain inside their head, they crack through their own skull. At this point, all of the gestating spiders that have been forming within the filaments in their brain, estimated to number between 80 and 200, can escape through the opening. Because of its unique containment difficulties caused by its cognitohazardous properties, SCP-632 has been given the Euclid object class. There is currently one live colony of SCP-632 stored in the biological containment wing of Site-52. The colony is housed in a small enclosure measured 20 cm by 40 cm by 20 cm and sustained on a diet of insects and water supplied through a vacuum chute. All personnel that work in proximity to SCP-632 are regularly screened. Physical contact with any SCP-632 is strictly prohibited, and all personnel are required to wear protective equipment and respirators at all times while handling live or deceased specimens. They keep a close eye on anyone developing any symptoms, especially headaches, the feeling of silk on the skin, or intrusive arachnid thoughts. It is the mid-19th century, in a village not far from St. Petersburg, Russia, where a sideshow carnival has been set up. There are a number of tents displaying various attractions, a man juggling fire in front of one. In another, a large bear balances on top of a ball. A detective from the St. Petersburg police force has been led here in the course of his investigation into the disappearance of a local chess prodigy's twin daughters. He had heard a rumor that the girls may be here, and he could easily imagine a kidnapping victim forced to perform as part of this seedy traveling circus. After passing by a contortionist and a man throwing knives at a woman strapped to a board, he found what he had been looking for, a large tent with a hand-painted sign reading, The Samurai, See the Unbeatable Chess Automaton. The detective had heard about these kinds of shows, and had even seen one himself. They would claim that their mechanical contraption could somehow play chess and beat even the best grandmasters without any human assistance, but the detective knew their secret. Inside was a person, cleverly hidden in such a way that you'd have no idea from the outside. But there was always someone in there, pulling on strings or levers to manipulate the machinery as the crowd looked on amazed at the feats technology was capable of. And who better to hide inside one of these charlatan boxes than a small girl who had already shown an incredible aptitude for chess. Two girls were even better than one. They could work together or take turns playing in shifts. The detective had the feeling in his gut that had yet to be wrong. The girls were in that machine. The detective enters the tent housing the automaton, but is stopped at the entrance and told that he has to pay if he wants to see. The smoky, lamp-lit tent is crowded with men all huddled around something in the center. A burst of cheers come from the throng, and again the man demands payment for entrance, poking the detective in the chest, telling him he has to pay or get out. The detective asks if he's the owner of the machine, but the man says he's just the exhibitor. He again stresses that the man has to pay or he'll be forced to leave, again punctuating his point with a stern poke to the chest. As the man pokes the detective again though, the detective grabs his hand and twists his arm behind his back. He asks again who the owner of the machine is, but the exhibitor, through gritted teeth, tells him he really doesn't know. He only communicates through letters and doesn't know the owner's real name or even what he looks like. The detective shoves the man aside and heads deeper into the tent. He enters the crowd of men, pushing them aside, and finally sees what everyone has been so amazed by. There in the middle of the room is a chessboard on top of a steel table connected to a small steam engine. Sitting next to the table is a stationary suit of samurai armor, and across from that is a Russian man who appears to be deep in thought. He is playing chess and his game against the samurai does not look to be going well. 
The detective sees the man make his move, and then, almost instantaneously, a piece moves by itself across the board in response. The man buries his head in his hands. Checkmate. The crowd erupts in cheers as the detective makes his way to the table. The exhibitor is rushing towards him, trying to stop the detective as he inspects the samurai suit. The suit falls to the ground. It's empty. The exhibitor is pulling on the detective, pleading with him to leave. The detective knows the girls are in here, though. If not in the suit of armor, then under the table itself. The detective grabs the chessboard and pulls. To his surprise, it comes off easily. And underneath is… machinery. A complicated series of tubes, magnets, and gears whir and hum with electric current. The detective can hardly comprehend what he's looking at until he spots it. There in the middle of the machinery are two glass jars, connected to the rest of the device by wires. There's a pink blob of organic material in each jar. Brain matter. And they are labeled with the missing girl's names. This is SCP-1875, also known as the Antique Chess Computer. SCP-1875 is a chess automaton from the Victorian period that is made up of four main components. The first of which, SCP-1875-1, is a steel table measuring 72 centimeters by 72 centimeters by 64 centimeters, with a standard 8 by 8 chessboard painted on top. Inside the steel box is a sophisticated piece of machinery that combines mechanical and biological elements. The movement of the pieces comes by way of magnets, with the moves themselves appearing to be decided by an analytical engine. Integrated into the analytical engine is brain tissue from the twin 14-year-old daughters of a Russian chess prodigy who went missing during the 19th century and were never found. The pieces, which have been designated SCP-18752, form a standard 32-piece chess set and are carved in an oriental style. The pieces have magnetic bases, and the tops have been identified as being carved human bone and genetically matching the brain tissue in the machine. SCP-18753 is a small steam engine with variable speeds that is connected to the machine via a drive shaft. SCP-18754 is a suit of 18th century Gusoku-style samurai armor. The armor appears to have no actual connection to the machine, mechanical or otherwise and it now seems as though the armor was merely a prop. Though multiple Foundation researchers have reported feeling a sense of unease and anxiety after making eye contact with the suit's mask. SCP-1875 continues to be fully operational and even has adjustable difficulty levels depending on which speed the steam engine is set to. To test the chess playing abilities of the machine, a D-class personnel was seated at the machine across from the samurai and moves that were decided by chess software were broadcast into the room. Games were played on each of the machine's five settings, and the chess software was used to measure SCP-1875's estimated rating on the ELO system, which is a method used to calculate the relative skill of players, with a higher number being better. At the first setting, the machine exhibited a chess playing ability that would be rated in the 800 to 1000 range which would be the equivalent of someone who knew how to move the pieces correctly, but otherwise was laughably bad. The second setting produced a result closer to 1200, which would put it firmly in the novice category. The third setting improved the automaton's ability to anywhere between a 1200 and 2500 rating, which meant that it could perform like an amateur all the way up to a master level. The fourth setting, though, was where the machine became truly incredible, and operated above a 2500 ELO rating. At that level, it would play like a chess grandmaster, and sometimes operated at a level higher than any human has ever been recorded. The fifth and final setting was baffling, though. The machine would play erratically, sometimes at a level even higher than that measured on the fourth setting, but then in the next game would make nonsensical decisions or look like it was trying to lose, sometimes even making moves that were illegal. Multiple games were played at this setting, and the amount of illogical moves only increased. The pieces began to move faster and faster, and eventually they began to ram together until several were chipped. The testing was quickly halted after this and further tests were suspended until a way to test without potentially damaging the pieces was found. Following this bizarre result, something even stranger happened. Five minutes after the test, an email was received by all members of the SCP-1875 email distribution list. 
The message, which appeared to come from a research analyst involved with 1875 research, consisted only of a single image, which has been classified as it is suspected of having dangerous memetic properties. Multiple members of staff opened the email, leading them to unintentionally view the attached image, and soon after reported numerous symptoms. They would immediately begin feeling anxiety, followed by a headache and fever. Two hours after viewing the image, they would begin feeling restless, unable to sleep, and hear auditory hallucinations. After four hours, visual hallucinations would begin as well. After seven hours, while still awake, they'd be exhibiting less and less response to stimuli. After 11 hours, there would be only brief periods of lucidity, during which the afflicted person would appear to recover completely and immediately demand access to the computer on which they originally observed the image. After 12 hours, well, it only gets worse from there. SCP-1875 has been classified as Euclid, and the most important aspect of its containment is that it never comes within transmission range of a wireless data network of any kind. To help ensure this, the anomaly is kept contained within a Faraday cage at all times, and a network security expert is always on site. During testing, the steam engine's speed is only to be placed on one of the first four settings, and never the fifth. This rule became necessary following a test at the fifth level, after which a laptop computer was introduced into the Faraday cage to see if new research material would be transferred onto the computer similar to how the memetic image appeared. It seems, though, that the laptop used was somehow infected and spread its virus to the entirety of the site's computer networks. All electronic communications with the facility were strictly forbidden by the O5 Council itself, which shows just how dangerous this could be. No electronic communications of any kind would be allowed until it can be determined just how SCP-1875 is transmitting its extremely dangerous memetic image and how it can be prevented. In the future, should any staff come to unintentionally view or open an email that contains shachmate.exe, they are to immediately… Mm. Ugh. Uh, what happened? No, I'm, I'm fine. Uh, are we still recording? Yeah, no, I can take it from… Uh... The group of children on their bikes stare intently at the large, abandoned house. Rumors have been circulating all school year about a monster that lives inside. One child tells the others about the kid from a couple towns over who went inside and never came back out, and it's easy to believe that something evil could be lurking inside the rundown home with its peeling paint and many broken windows. The children begin teasing each other, daring one another to go in and see the monster for themselves. No one seems especially eager to volunteer, though, as they all egg each other on. As the group of children joke about who should be forced to go inside, Another comes riding up behind them, struggling to catch his breath. You left me behind again, he complains. Clearly, this is not the first time that this smallest child of the group has been made to try and keep up with his bigger and faster friends. The bigger kids all turn to look at him. They don't need to discuss it any further. The answer to who must go inside has already been decided. The smaller child tries to protest, but ultimately, what decision does he have but to go inside? He can't let everyone else think that he's a chicken, he's got to prove once and for all that he's just as tough as any of them. Without another word, he lets his bike fall into the dirt and makes his way towards the big, creepy house. The door pushes open without any resistance, and the boy looks into the dark house. The boy steps inside, and the floorboards creak loudly under his feet. The inside looks much like the outside, old, worn, and abandoned. But then, he hears something, a scratching noise coming from above him. He turns to leave, but he can see all of his friends through the doorway, and they motion for him to keep going. The boy steals his nerves and turns back. He's going to show them just how brave he is. The boy starts up the stairs, each one groaning as he steps onto it. He reaches the top of the stairs to find a landing with more rooms, each full of dirt and debris. There's spray paint on many of the walls and lots of trash. It looks like teens may use this as a place to hang out, but there at the other side of the landing is one more room, and the door is shut. From outside, the group of children can see through the upper windows as the boy makes his way through the house. They're not laughing and teasing any longer. In fact, they're impressed by how bravely he is exploring the old home. Though none of them would admit it out loud, he's earning their respect. The boy reaches the shut door at the end of the hall and presses his ear to it, but he doesn't hear anything inside. He places his hand on the doorknob and slowly opens it. The boy screams and falls backwards. 
as the cat that was hiding inside panics and jumps through one of the open windows. The boy can't help but laugh. Of course it was just a... The boy screams again as the floor gives way beneath him and he crashes down onto the first floor in a pile of debris. He's stunned by the fall before starting to scream again as that floor gives way too. His yelling is silenced by the air being knocked out of him as he hits the basement floor. He's covered in dust and pieces of two floors he fell through. He feels bruised and sore, but he can wiggle his fingers and toes. He's not paralyzed, and it doesn't even feel like he's broken a bone. Maybe he's okay. But no, he's definitely not okay. Because suddenly, there's something picking him up off the floor. As his eyes adjust to the dark basement, he sees what it is that's holding him. It's half man, half machine, a huge disgusting mix of metal and flesh. The boy is too scared to scream anymore as the creature's unmoving, dead-looking eyes stare straight into his. Its face looks as though the skin has been stretched across a human metallic skull. The boy can only watch as the monster raises its sharp metallic fingers and brushes the dirt out of the boy's hair. The boy starts to whimper, but whatever this thing is, it doesn't seem to want to hurt him. A tinny, robotic voice coming from a small device on the creature's face suddenly breaks the silence. Al-Anta ala mayuram. The boy doesn't understand, but the robotic man tilts his horrific head to the side and repeats the same thing. The boy is still confused, but he feels like the robot is trying to tell him something. He somehow gets the sense that it's not going to hurt him. Is this the monster that everyone has been afraid of? A misunderstood machine man living down here in the basement? The robot flinches as something is smashed on the back of his head. He tosses the boy to the side and turns to see the boy's friends, each of them armed with pieces of wood and other scraps as weapons. They've come here to save their friend from the monster that they dared him to find. Another runs up to strike the robot, but before he can reach him, he falls to his knees in pain, as do the rest of the children. The creature has begun emitting a high-frequency noise, and the children try to cover their ears. They all feel a searing pain that makes it feel as though their heads will explode. The piercing noise continues to ring out, but the monster looks like it has entered some kind of dormant state and is no longer moving. The small boy is able to slowly get back to his knees, hands still clasped to the side of his head, and stand up. He runs past the monster and his friends who are writhing on the floor in pain, up the stairs and out of the old house. A woman stands at a kitchen counter, chopping vegetables for their dinner that evening, and talking to her oldest daughter about her plans for that weekend, when the back door suddenly bursts open. Standing there is her son, the small boy. He's barely able to whisper the words, Monster! There's a monster in the basement! Before he collapses, blood pouring from his ears and nose, before he begins convulsing on the floor. At the local police station, an officer is speaking on the phone. I see. Yes, that is quite strange. A metal man? You don't say. I'll send someone out there right away. Don't go anywhere. The police officer hangs up the phone and looks around, making sure no one is nearby or listening to him, and then takes out a cell phone. He dials a number from memory, and someone answers on the other end almost immediately. Yes, this is Field Agent Patch, the police officer says. You need to get a containment team out here right away, and a good one too. I don't know what it is, but it's dangerous. An SCP Foundation mobile task force that specializes in containing dangerous humanoid threats soon arrived at the house and took the anomaly into captivity. Misinformation teams concocted a cover story about a gas leak leading to the unfortunate deaths of several of the town's children and administering amnestics to any potential witnesses. Once the messy business of containment was over, though, it was time to figure out just what this strange creature was. SCP-203 appears to have at one time been a Caucasian human male, though its appearance now is far different than it once was. This bipedal humanoid creature stands 2.5 meters tall and weighs roughly 200 kilograms. Both its incredible height and weight are due to the fact that the man's original skeleton has been entirely removed and replaced with a mechanical framework made of cast iron. The metal skeleton is much larger than the original bones, and in many places SCP-203's skin has split from being stretched over it, revealing the mechanical structure underneath. Other parts of the framework appear to have been intentionally made to protrude through the skin, though it is unclear for what purpose. In addition to this larger-than-normal mechanical skeleton, a number of other augmentations are present on SCP-203. Its fingers have been extended into sharpened, hook-like barbs that are approximately one meter long. Its lips have been removed entirely, making it clear that there is no movable jawbone and that the skull is likely one large hollow piece of metal and there are several more hook-like protrusions jutting out around the mouth area, smaller but similar in appearance to the fingers. SCP-203's legs have been modified as well, 
with two added joints that give them an appearance more akin to a dog's, and its toes have been removed and replaced with a solid piece of metal similar to those found in steel-toed boots. Its chest has no sternum or breastplate, which causes the skin stretched across to pull inward as its diaphragm contracts. Its ears have also been removed, though it still seems to possess hearing that is far beyond that of an average human. And while its eyes still remain, they are held in a permanently forward-facing position by several needles that emerge from the eye sockets. The irises also appear permanently dilated and do not react to light. In place of a mouth is a small speaker covered by a metal grate that is capable of producing basic vocalizations, though with a distinctly robotic sound to them. Tests have shown that SCP-203 has a basic understanding of English, but its own primary language seems to be a type of Arabic, though there are no records of the exact dialect. SCP-203 does not need to eat or drink, and without any visible mouth, it is likely incapable of either. Instead, it runs off of a power cell located within its body that will provide energy for up to 72 hours. After those three days, SCP-203 will shut down and enter a hibernation state for three to four hours, during which its power source will recharge, providing it with another 72 hours of energy. All attempts to examine SCP-203 by either X-ray, CT, ultrasound, and other forms of diagnostic imagery have failed, and attempts at exploratory surgery have triggered its defense mechanisms which are both painful and deadly. When it perceives that it is being threatened in some way, SCP-203 is capable of emitting a high-frequency droning sound that has a profoundly damaging effect on the human nervous system. The effects of this defense mechanism were able to be observed directly when a D-Class personnel accidentally struck SCP-203 and its droning sound was activated. Immediately after being exposed to the sound, D-104 experienced a severe headache. After 15 minutes, the headache grew worse and D-104 began to bleed from the ears. After a half hour, the D-Class who had now gone to the infirmary began to experience seizures and was bleeding from all of his orifices. Ten minutes later, the D-Class was dead. Another test was performed, and the results were nearly identical, with symptoms progressing at roughly the same rate. However, this time, rather than move the D-Class to the infirmary, it was kept in the cell with SCP-203. After 40 minutes, the D-Class was dead, and a few minutes later, 203 finally ceased its droning sound. SCP-203 then approached the body of the deceased D-Class and began to use its own augmentations to start removing the skeleton of the D-Class. While SCP-203 was stopped before it could complete its task, it now appears that the droning sound it produces is a defense mechanism but may also be a part of the process by which it creates new instances of SCP-203. In interviews with SCP-203, it claims to have no memories of its life prior to its augmentation. It says that it now exists in a near constant state of pain and confusion and that the times when its battery is expended and it enters a rest state are its only escape from the pain of its existence. It also claims that it has no memory of what happens once its defense mechanism is activated, nor does it remember what it did to the body of the D-Class that was left in its cell. However, it is unknown just how truthful SCP-203 is being. There has been no way to verify anything that SCP-203 tells researchers, and for the time being, its statements are to be regarded by Foundation staff as an attempt to elicit sympathy or otherwise manipulate them emotionally. It's made several requests for pain-killing medication and anesthetics, but so far, all of these requests have been denied. SCP-203 has been classified as Euclid, and it is kept in a specialized storage bunker at a research site. Two D-Class personnel equipped with sound filtering equipment guard it at all times, and it is accompanied by an armed escort to any testing or research sessions. Is SCP-203 the ultimate victim? A normal human that was transformed against his will into a crude amalgamation of man and machine? Maybe there is something more to SCP-203, or rather, less. Is SCP-203 fooling all of us? Is this tortured iron soul nothing more than a metallic monster disguising itself with the skin of its last victim? Perhaps with more research, we will one day know the answer. The final bell rings, signaling the end of a new class's first day at middle school. A girl exits the building, her backpack slung over her shoulder, body hunched under its unfamiliar weight. It's been a long and tiring day. Her family just moved to this small Oklahoma town from the big city and, of course, she's spent every minute since then trying to adjust to her new surroundings. It's never easy to be the new kid in town. Right now, all she wants to do is to get home and relax. She doesn't want to think about school and its related anxieties for the rest of the night. As she walks down the stairs, she notices the school bus parked at the curb. 
Thank goodness, she thinks. I can't wait to get out of here. This day can't end soon enough. But for some reason, something about this bus sets her nerves on edge. What is it that just seems off? There's nothing blatantly wrong with the bus, but when she looks closer, she realizes that it definitely looks a little strange. The different parts of the bus just don't add up. Some parts are new, clearly just off the factory floor, while others are battered and bruised from long-time wear. Some parts even seem to come from different makes and models of bus. I guess it's not that strange, she thinks. After all, her old school always had a measly budget. You could practically see the road through holes in the floor sometimes. Her new one probably just has those same issues. Aren't those problems all over the country, after all? The school probably just had to buy a dilapidated old bus cobbled together from random parts to make ends meet. And besides, she thinks, as she watches her classmates pile onto the strange bus without a second thought, none of the other kids seem to think that there's anything weird going on. This must all just be in my head, she thinks. I'm probably just being weird because I'm so tired. I can't let myself become the new girl and the weird girl. The girl is startled as she hears a voice behind her. Hey! She turns and sees a boy that she recognizes. He sits behind her in class. They haven't spoken before now, but he seems friendly enough. You're the new kid in school, aren't you? He says. Yes, my family just moved to town. She tries to talk to him, but she can't help but keep getting distracted by the weird bus. Right, right. The boy glances at the bus, as if he can sense her discomfort with it. You worried about the bus? I was pretty nervous my first time riding it, but I don't worry about it anymore. You get used to it, he tells her. Uh, right, she says. The girl feels her cheeks going red with embarrassment. She doesn't want her classmate to think that she's scared of riding a bus. What if he tells the other kids that she's frightened of a bus ride? They're all going to think that she's some kind of silly baby. I'm not scared of the bus. It is just a bus, right? The boy grins, as if he knows something that she doesn't know. The girl doesn't want to admit her fear, and so with a defiant step, she climbs the stairs and enters the bus. Once she's on board, her unease doesn't go away. The first thing that she notices is that there is no one in the driver's seat. That's weird. Did the driver just step away to use the bathroom or something? It seems pretty irresponsible to leave the bus unattended. There's a line forming behind her, though, so she doesn't have time to think about this. She takes a seat and stares out the window, keeping to herself. The boy from her class follows and takes a seat next to her. It's a little wild at first, but trust me, you'll get used to it fast. In fact, some of us think it's kind of fun now. The girl blinks in confusion. Who is this weirdo that gets such a kick out of riding the bus? She almost wants to snap at him, to tell him that of course she's not scared of riding the bus. She's ridden the bus hundreds of times back at her old school. But at the same time, there's definitely something weird going on here. And as much as she's trying to play it cool, she's clearly not able to hide her feelings. This boy can easily sense that she's uncomfortable. Suddenly, the bus lurches into action and pulls away from the curb. But wait, how can this be? She never saw the driver get back on board. The bus can't be driving itself, can it? She stands up in her seat and cranes her neck to see. Her eyes bulge from her head in fear and surprise as she realizes that, in fact, there's no one driving the bus at all. The driver's seat is empty and the wheel is turning by itself as the bus careens down the road. Who's driving the bus? She shouts, but the other kids barely even react to her outburst. Most of them are chattering amongst themselves, and only one or two turn to look at her briefly, before shrugging and turning back to their own private conversations. A chorus of giggles behind her alert her to the fact that she's just completely embarrassed herself. What's the matter, you scared? Calls an older boy from the back of the bus, guffawing loudly. Of course no one's driving. Don't you know anything? Leave her alone, says the boy in the seat next to her. It's her first time. She's never ridden the bus before. She's too panicked to correct him that, yes, she has been on the bus before, but not a bus like this one. What's going on? We're all going to die, she cries, clutching at the seat in front of her in terror. Despite her fear, though, she can't help but notice that the bus isn't simply speeding into oblivion. The bus obeys all the traffic laws, stopping at stop signs and signaling before turns. It's almost as if the bus itself is alive and aware of what it's doing. That's just how it is, says the boy next to her in a matter-of-fact voice as if he's anticipated her question. Apparently, this is a normal day for kids here in this Oklahoma town. The girl doesn't think she could ever get used to a bus that drives itself. But what comes next is going to prove to be even stranger. But you might want to close your eyes for this next part, says the boy. The girl asks him what he means by that. But before he can answer, she feels a strange wave of sudden nausea overcome her. Her vision goes hazy, and the whole world seems to waver in her sight. But the sensation passes quickly, and everything is quickly back to normal. 
or is it? She turns to look out the window. The city passing by is familiar. She can recognize many of the same buildings that she passed on her way to school this morning, but now they seem strangely altered. The structures are in advanced states of disrepair, with broken windows and boarded up doors. The gutters are filled with trash and debris, and the streets seem to be abandoned. The bus takes a left turn down a side street, and the girl catches a brief glimpse of the town's city hall in the distance. She gasps. City Hall is on fire, great gouts of hot red flame pouring from the shattered windows. Sirens echo through the air. The sky above is an ominous red, filled with angry storm clouds with jagged bolts of dry lightning dancing between the thunderheads, and she can see the funnel of a distant tornado making a touchdown in the hills. The bus briefly comes to a stop in front of the library, dutifully obeying a flickering traffic light. The library's windows are dark, but she can vaguely see shapes moving about inside. Electric sparks shoot from malfunctioning street lamps and downed power cables flail like angry snakes in the street. It looks like some terrible natural disaster has hit the city, but what could it be? Surely she would have heard some warning while she was at school. It wouldn't have just carried on as usual in the classroom while the world outside burned. She turns to the boy next to her, a fearful question on her trembling lips. He seems to know what's going on. Otherwise, how could he be so eerily calm while everything outside the bus is falling apart or on fire? What happened to the city? Was there an earthquake? No, he would have felt it. Was there a hurricane? Every possible disaster scenario runs through her head as she desperately tries to think of an explanation. But what happens next reveals to her that there's no natural explanation for the strange sights that assail her eyes. As she watches through the window, a squadron of armed soldiers march down the street toward the darkened library. Suddenly the doors fly open and people pour out, screaming as if they're being chased by some unspeakable evil. The girl expects that the soldiers must be here for disaster relief, but she is horrified when, instead of helping the escaping library patrons, they instead open fire upon the crowd. The girl screams in terror, but the other kids barely even notice. They're too busy talking or laughing. One kid is so disinterested in the spectacle outside that he's playing with a handheld game console rather than watch the carnage unfold. How can this be happening? Has the whole world gone crazy? She's filled with terror as she wonders, is the whole town under siege? Is her house still standing? Are her parents safe? Where is this bus even taking her? I told you that you might want to cover your eyes, says the boy next to her. The bus continues on its route, passing all sorts of terrifying sights. A parking lot has been transformed into a mass grave. She watches as uniformed police line up peaceful citizens against a brick wall to brutally execute them by firing squad. Mass riots are taking place in the town's central park. People are yelling obscenities and pounding one another into pulp, while armed law enforcement officers sweep in to escalate the situation. The air is thick with screams, gunfire, and the smell of burning bodies. The shopping mall is overrun with giant spiders, which chase screaming shoppers out of the exits. She sees rats as big as cars scurrying out of the alleyways, grabbing random people with their taloned paws and biting their heads off with their long, sharp incisors. On the distant hills, she can also make out the outlines of even stranger creatures that she cannot identify. Dinosaurs, aliens, demons, she doesn't come from a particularly religious family, but the sights that she sees today definitely make her think that she might be seeing a glimpse into the maw of hell itself. The girl has never seen anything so awful in all her life. To her surprise, several of the other kids cheer as the bus drives past a gaggle of walking corpses. They're mutilated and half decomposed, but somehow still mobile shambling down the sidewalk and moaning. How can the other kids be enjoying this? Yeah, 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 chant the kids. Zombies, that rules. Maybe we'll get to see them eat some brains for once, cries the older boy in the back of the bus with sudden glee. What is going on? repeats the girl. It's just the usual bus ride, says the boy next to her. Don't worry, I felt the same way when I first started at this school, but it's really not so bad. I mean, it's kind of cool, isn't it? The girl opens her mouth to respond, but she's suddenly overcome with that familiar feeling of nausea. The world quivers briefly in front of her, and suddenly, everything is back to normal. The sky is clear and blue, the buildings are no longer dilapidated, people are bustling in the streets, going about their usual business. There's no sign of any of the horrors that she just witnessed. No fires, no soldiers, no monsters, and no zombies. The boy next to her commented that they must have been reaching someone's stop. From around the bus, she hears several other kids groan in frustration. They were hoping that they would get to see some exciting zombie carnage, but it looks like that show will have to wait for another time. The bus slowly comes to a halt, and the girl tenses as she hears the hiss of its air brakes. The door opens, and the girl realizes that the bus has stopped in front of her house. She's relieved to see that her house is standing, 
and she can see her mother gardening in the front yard, safe and sound. Was it all a dream? This is my stop, says the girl, standing up as if in a daze. Uh, The first time's always a little wild, says the boy as she leaves. Don't worry, tomorrow will be easier. The girl steps onto the curb and away from the bus. The doors close behind her, and the bus pulls away, continuing on its journey. Did you enjoy your first day of school today? asks the girl's mother. The girl can only stare in shock as the bus drives away. What just happened? Did a self-driving bus just take her on a tour of hell before bringing her right to her own doorstep? Or did she really just imagine that whole experience? As you astute Foundation veterans have probably already put together, this new girl at school didn't imagine anything she just saw. That girl just had her first encounter with SCP-3583. At face value, SCP-3583 resembles an ordinary school bus, albeit one composed of completely random parts all held together by some unknown force. The bus is self-driving and in fact resists any attempt by a human to sit in the driver's seat. At some point, SCP-3583 became attached to a particular school in an undisclosed Oklahoma town for reasons the SCP Foundation still doesn't understand. Every school day, at 3.45 p.m., it appears outside of the school just as the school day comes to a close. The bus can hold up to 56 children and up to 8 adults. If it judges that not enough children have boarded, SCP-3583 will begin to honk its horn. The horn has a peculiar, hypnotic effect on all children within hearing range. They will be compelled to drop whatever they are doing and board the bus, meaning that the bus has some innate cognitohazardous properties. If the bus still feels that it hasn't reached its quota, it will increase the volume of its horn until it has attracted enough children that it can begin its route. Depending on how many adults have boarded, SCP-3583 has two distinct patterns of behavior. If four or fewer adults are aboard, SCP-3583 enters behavior pattern 1. In this pattern, SCP-3583 will dematerialize and enter a parallel reality called SCP-3583-A. SCP-3583-A superficially resembles the normal geography of the same Oklahoma town, with some minor but very important changes. The typical city landscape is replaced with a hellish alternative full of crumbling architecture, marauding monsters, shambling zombies, fires and natural disasters, and instances of military violence and civil unrest. SCP-3583 will travel through this terrifying hell dimension along normal bus routes, studiously obeying all traffic laws and pausing to re-enter our own reality only to deliver kids to their own homes. Interestingly, SCP-3583 only offers door-to-door service and ignores all conventionally posted bus stops. If five or more adults are aboard, SCP-3583 enters behavior pattern 2. In this pattern, SCP-3583 will travel to the sites of mass casualty events, seemingly arriving in the days or weeks preceding the incident, where it will circle the area for approximately 45 to 100 minutes. After this, it will enter pattern 1, delivering each child passenger to their home before then delivering its adult passengers home as well. Known mass casualty sites visited include Pompeii, Nanking, and the World Trade Center in New York. Passengers inside SCP-3583 can take photos or video through the bus window, and all footage shot from within SCP-3583 matches exactly with archive footage taken at the mass casualty site at the time that SCP-3583 supposedly visited. However, SCP-3583 itself has never been reported by witnesses at any site or seen in any archive footage of any site. Luckily, SCP-3583 has proven to be a boon to this struggling school district. The school principal noted that SCP-3583 has a better safety record than any human driver. In addition, it never calls in sick and is never late for a pickup or drop-off. Every student that has received a ride in SCP-3583 has arrived safely, if a little shaken, at their home destination. And best of all, SCP-3583 is saving the school a lot of money on both driver pay and vehicle maintenance, money that the school has used to hire a new music teacher. The general consensus of the local community is that as long as SCP-3583 wants to work as a school bus and continues to do a good job, who are they to look a gift horse in the mouth? Although it still might behoove some of SCP-3583's more sensitive riders to shut their eyes and plug their ears until they get safely home. The SCP Foundation first became aware of SCP-3583 when students began posting cell phone footage of their rides online. Although the Foundation has successfully scrubbed information about SCP-3583 from the internet, it has been less successful in figuring out what to do with the so-called school bus from hell. Foundation field agents are so far unable to explain SCP-3583's motive or operations. 
Conventional attempts to contain SCP-3583, such as impounding the bus or towing it to the junkyard, are futile. SCP-3583 will immediately dematerialize, falling apart into a rubble of disparate bus parts as the force binding it together appears to abandon this plane. However, SCP-3583 will always return the next school day, ready and willing to begin its afternoon shift. Agents have considered closing the affected school, but feared that would only move the problem, as SCP-3583 would simply attach itself to another school. The SCP Foundation is currently monitoring the situation and has several agents embedded within the school district posing as regular staff. Because of this immense difficulty in containment, SCP-3583 has been given the Keter Object Class. Considering the number of SCP anomalies that involve horrific bodily harm being done to their victims, it's honestly a breath of fresh air to be dealing with one this seemingly benevolent, a little post-traumatic stress disorder aside, of course. And while Hellbus may be what most around the Foundation have taken to referring to this particular anomaly, I'm going to stick to my own name, the Tragic School Bus. Now go and watch another entry from the files of Dr. Bob, like Man-Eating Bus SCP-2086 rerouting for another piece of public transportation with a terrifying secret. And make sure you subscribe and turn on notifications so you don't miss a single anomaly as we delve further and further into the SCP Foundation's classified archives.